Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last day of the 2021 Summer FreeBSD Developer Summit. Um, I hope you've all been having fun the last couple of days. I know the hallway track has been active. Folks have been chatting about different things, so I'll be checking in again with that today. Uh, we have several things on our, sch our schedule today, various talks, uh, and a, I believe at least one working group session uh, on Beehive that I think I'm helping to, to chair. Uh, and then um, we're going to have a closing session today. Uh, we have to so stick around for that. In particular, we're going to play a, a, a collaborative game, quiz game, a trivia game on Kahoot, which will be a lot of fun. In fact, I think I have something to show you here. Uh -huh. There we go. The winner, we're going to actually ship off um, a like special edition medal to whoever wins our quiz earlier today. So do hang around so you can see that. Um, in particular, we're going to be using the app Kahoot that I know we've used, that uh, Benedict has used at several Europe BSC cons in the past. So if you want to, you may want to go ahead and download the app to your phone or tablet uh, if you want to use that to play the game. Uh, but we'll be doing that later in the day for the quiz session. We also have a survey that we would like folks to fill out just to tell us about you know, how, how did the, the, the summit work for you? What worked, what didn't work? The link for that is on the wiki. We'll be posting it onto the chat um, various places in a little bit. So please fill that out sometime today. Uh, you know, once you've kind of, maybe after the conference is over and you've kind of let it all soak in, do give us some feedback and let us know what worked well and what didn't. Um, but with all that said, our first talk today is from Constantine and it's about AMD64 mode switching. So I'm gonna turn it over to Constantine if you're ready. Yeah, yes, I'm so. Yep, I can I can see you and hear you. Mm -hmm. So, do do you see my slides? Yep, you're all good. Okay. Okay. Hello, I'm Konstantin Belousov. I'm source commuter and uh, uh, FreeBSD Foundation technical staff member. I work on FreeBSD for relatively long time, not long, so long as other people, but uh, quite enough to uh, de facto see some uh, uh, Inter interesting processes that happens in the in industry and free BSD and related uh, parts. So I will try to explain uh, something curious that uh, happens right now in the um, Intel area of Intel and AMD architecture. It, it is uh, for external observers, it might be surprising that this thing uh, occurs for such uh, old and uh, so to say established architecture. It is not uh, as uh, stunning as, for instance, release of ARM v V9 architecture, but it's still curious event. And I will try to explain wh what, why uh, happens and uh, how it affects operating systems in particular for BSD. Uh, the thing that I will talk about is context switching. By context switch, uh, in different con uh, situations, uh, people might mean different things. For instance, most common is the uh, 
uh, discussion of the uh, inter-thread context switching where you uh, stop executing one thread and start executing another thread. Uh, but this is not what uh, I mean yeah, and want to talk in the, there, I want to talk about interprotection domain context switching. When you uh, program uh, execute a syscall or causes a fault and execution changes from user mode to privileged kernel mode or where when kernel uh, returns control to back to the user mode. Actually, on uh, machines like uh, modern uh, ER32, ER3264, uh, some more context switching occurs. For instance, uh, SMI might uh, interrupt any execution and uh, machine switch into so-called system management mode or virtualization adds it on uh, perks. But uh, I will only talk about uh, user kernel and kernel user mode switching for normal program execution of traditional operating system. Uh, besides the words, if you have questions, you might uh, try to ask them when I switch uh, slides. Uh, it might be easier to uh, expand some explanations while uh, the topic is still hot. So when uh, the switch from user to kernel happens, why it happens at all? First, uh, there are synchronous events that are synchronous in the sense that they are initiated by the program itself. The program control uh, the moments when it wants to uh, ask for some ser kernel services. Most typical uh, situation is syscall. Another very common situation is exception, for instance, patch fault exception. This is uh, this happens uh, hundreds if not thousands of times on any uh, system that is busy. But there are also asynchronous events. Again, exceptions could be asynchronous in the sense that it is caused by program, but it is not strictly controlled by program. So it, is, it is somewhat, uh, I don't want to use the word imprecise because it has specific meaning, but uh, it means that uh, by asynchronous exception, I mean that uh, exception occurs in some point that is not directly controlled by the program, but caused by program. Another kind of asynchronous event is, of course, interrupts. And special kind of interrupts are non-maskable interrupts, uh, typical NMI itself, or machine check exception. Or unfortunately, for uh, the whole architecture, there is a, a whole class of non-maskable interrupts, which are very close to exceptions. It was discovered several years ago. Uh, it's um, something like, uh, there is no established uh, terminology. I call it delayed debug exceptions or something like that. So what happens, what handled when we enter the kernel? What should be handled by uh, architecture uh, to get the proper switch from user mode to kernel mode? Of course, we must uh, save the registers general purpose re registers that uh, uh, all programs have to use on MD64. Else kernel need to establish the right uh, uh, value for the flux register. In particular, very important uh, um, direction and uh, alignment check flux in the uh, flux register. Another shared resource that need to be fully switch it to kernel is a TLS-based hardware. I will talk in more details about it later. Another hardware resource that must be uh, set up for kernel is stack. Again, in recent times, uh, uh, due to the meltdown, we have to switch page tables. So we need to establish a new value for CR3, which is the pointer to the root of the page tables on the, uh, for the current, uh, current thread. Uh, 
there is more hardware in the CPU, but uh, we don't have to handle it on the uh, kernel entry. In particular, we don't uh, save or switch uh, floating point unit registers. Uh, we prefer to not allow uncontrolled use of floating point hardware in kernel and uh, require kernel code that does it to, to establish special context where uh, it will not cause corruption for the user mode values of these registers. And uh, another well-known part of the x86 architecture is segment registers, and uh, mostly we simply ignore them in the kernel. We are fine with whatever values were uh, used by the user mode uh, program there. Uh, there are details, but uh, mostly they are not important that we can get read, get, get uh, out without uh, handling. Uh, sorry, my dog interrupting. Uh, without much uh, doing anything about this registers. So uh, one of the big and large uh, things that need to be handled on the context switch is the uh, TLS base. Uh, how the, uh, first large first uh, thing that needs to be explained how TLS is uh, uh, set up for MD64 or x86 at all. It is still uh, based on segmentation even in modern stops. But uh, since uh, uh, IMD64 basically removed any possible uh, advanced use of segmentation that were possible in 16-bit or 32-bit, uh, they have to uh, do some after-source and uh, add the... Uh, in fact, ability to use uh, at least some segment registers for segmentation in 64-bit mode still. Because uh, there was simply no other uh, non-too-intrusive way to get uh, a TLS base for MD64 programs. So how it is done? It is done with uh, uh, segment registers that is called GS. And uh, AMD provides, uh, well, uh, Intel AMD provides the special MSR that allows to change the base of this register with full 64-bit write uh, as needed. And because TLS is needed to, to locate any data required for execution in kernel mode, it was critical that switch from uh, user mode to uh, JS base to kernel mode JS base can be executed without having any uh, other context uh, already set up. So AMD provides the swap JS instruction that exchange JS base with another MSR called KGS base. And uh, what happens? We enter this call with user JS base loaded into the register. We execute swap JS and uh, value from KGS base with which points for FreeBSD to the PCPU structure is loaded into the register. We get TLS, we get from the PCPU data and we can fetch whatever else is needed to establish the full kernel context. But uh, it, there are at least some um, important details that uh, make all this complicated. First, obviously, if you execute swap.js one more time, then you uh, switch back to the user mode JS base again. And this is fatal because executing with user control at uh, TLS base in kernel basically equivalent to arbitrary code execution. So uh, we must not uh, uh, do swap JS more than needed. Second, uh, after some time, it was realized that uh, switching TLS base uh, in this way where you need to write something into kernel control at MSR is actually very limited. It uh, doesn't allow to allow user mode to implement cheap threading uh, context switches like green threads or 
Tasklets or uh, Goroutines or whatever is the fashion at right now. Uh, basically, to switch from thread from this light thread to another light thread, you need to execute some syscall to reset the uh, TLS base value. And that was very inconvenient. So Intel proposed extension to the x86 uh, instructions where user get a direct control on the current value of the JS base uh, without executing syscall. It is available on the all recent CPUs approximately 10 years uh, or newer, so starting uh, with EV bridge, I believe. So it adds a complication because actually kernel no longer knows what is the current value of the JS base when it enters the user, uh, from user mode. This is one of the details that needs to be handled. It is important in the further uh, discussion. There are, of course, other parts that need to be handled. For instance, we need to switch to the correct stack. We, we can calculate what is the right stack to use uh, after we get a PCPU data from switching TLS. But uh, again, there are some complications. For, uh, for instance, for syscalls in synchronous exceptions, when we enter from the user mode, we can safely use the switch to the top of the user mode stack. There is, oh, sorry, kernel kernel mode stack for user thread. There is no much questions what should be loaded into the register except for PTI, but uh, again, I will talk about this later. For asynchronous exceptions and non maskable interrupts, it is more complicated because in principle, we can get exception, for instance, when we overflow stacks. So we need some mechanism that allows us to uh, establish a known good stack uh, regardless of the current state of the machine when exception occurred. And MD64 provides a mechanism called IST that uh, makes it possible to specify the top of stack for given kind of exceptions. But again, this also provides uh, further complications. Uh, I will talk about this later. And uh, you remember a problem that was called meltdown that was discovered several years ago, and that is uh, fixed by having uh, uh, separate page tables for user mode and kernel mode uh, execution. So we need to, if a PTI workaround is active, then we need to switch the page tables as well when we switch from user mode to kernel mode. Do it in the uh, kernel handler for the mode switch. And the last, I, I, of course, I didn't mention it everything, but the third uh, important class of the uh, system state that uh, must be accounted for when doing the switch is so called invisible CPU state. For instance, uh, NMI can be blocked on x86, but the state is not very uh, visible to the kernel. Kernel cannot directly query CPU about state of the NMA disabled. It needs to understand in which context it is it exec it executing to make proper decisions. Similarly, uh, the, there are some uh, interrupt blocks, uh, interrupt shadows, so called, that are that have very limited so scope. They are single instruction uh, shadows, but they are still there. And for instance, uh, debug exception disabled that can shadow the next instruction else need to be accounted for when we switch the state. Uh, anybody have any questions for this block? No? Okay, so what problems all this uh, have? Uh, it is. It should be obvious now. Actually, it is very complicated. You need to handle a lot of transitions and understand uh, how uh, the transition from one uh, switch to one, how the switch from uh, one bit of state to another bit affects any other uh, handling in the kernel. 
Why? Because uh, switching is not atomic. It can be interrupted, for instance, by NMI or fouls that occur when you have some bugs in your code and that causes uh, nested, for instance, general protection fault while you're still uh, executing the switch. And it would be nice to not die silently and typically cause a reboot of the machine, but at least provide some diagnostic to user so that he sees clearly what happens and can provide feedback so it can, the bug can be debugged and fix it instead of doing silent reboot. Uh, so each uh, handler that can interrupt another hand, handler must understand what exactly was interrupted, uh, which state was already switched, which was not. Uh, for instance, if we didn't switch at stacks, then on for PTI we might overflow the very limited uh, trampoline stack that we have mapped both in user space and kernel space um, page tables. So we might need to avoid doing something large on PTI stack and do uh, switch to proper stack faster than we would do otherwise. If we have nested exceptions that use IST stack switch mechanism, then it is a fatal outright because uh, second exception of the same kind corrupts IST stack. It would override the already written foul data on the stack. Uh, the best example is actually a machine check exception. If you have non-fatal machine check exception, uh, which is actually <clears throat> non-maskable and the uh, second fatal MC comes on and it uh, overrides the existing non-fatal MC, then we can't return back. And as I said, not all state is visible. We can have something that uh, we can't fully restore because we simply cannot uh, query it and uh, should understand what was uh, interrupted. If we MC handler interrupted an MI uh, handler, then I read would uh, restore uh, reallow and MI. It should not be allowed and so on and so on. So uh, this becomes complicated. It was not initially that complex, but uh, uh, the complexity grown uh, both when uh, mitigations were applied, mitigations are naturally applied at the context switch time. And when some details of architecture were understood, uh, which causes uh, to handle more specific case at this uh, switch moments. Similarly, when we return to user space, basically we need to rewind, but uh, there are some additional steps that we, we as FreeBSD handle on the return. And for instance, we restore segment re registers when we return to user space. And uh, uh, this might uh, fall because user might create this a context where register were specially written, uh, which are not valid for user space to load. Uh, similarly, uh, when we switch stack and uh, page and tables to the user mode, we get less and less of working kernel environment and we have uh, to work in and handle faults in restricted context. But uh, we might fault when the last instruction that switches to user mode I read is executed, it might fault for similar reason because uh, it also loads at segment registers. It loads user user mode uh, instruction pointer, which must be in the canonical format. If it is not canonical, we fault. We load stack pointer again. Stack pointer for user space must be in correct format. Otherwise, we fault and so on, so on. So uh, fault handlers need to understand if we execute the. Uh, segment load uh, for user space. If we executed IRED for user space, in all these cases, we must do special um, handling to not uh, kill the machine, but to restore the context knowing that the, we executed in half the constructed kernel, kernel environment. Uh, so uh, what would be nice to have from all this mess? First, it would be very nice to get the uh, mode switch, context switch code more atomic. 
currently we all, almost have a risk construction where we manually switch each bit of the kernel environment to get the fin final state. If hardware could handle more of it atomically, it would uh, ease the work of fault handler because it cannot be uh, started executing in the mode where half of the switching is done, half of is not. Uh, again, it would be nice to get more um, elements of what is currently in modern operating system is considered a context to be added to this hardware facilities. For instance, uh, TLS based, JS based. It would be very nice if we don't need to uh, calculate how many swap JS instructions we already executed and avoid the need to, or avoid the whole class of the box where we executed swap JS one more time if hardware tracked it. And hardware really knows in which mode we executing, so it, it can do it properly itself. It just was not designed with this in mind. Again, another thing is the interrupt shadowing. It would be nice if interrupt shadowing would uh, not survive at the mode switch. It, it would fix both uh, um, several ways for user space to maliciously uh, affect kernel and simplify the kernel handling. It would be nice to get uh, the explicit knowledge of the NMI blocking state. It uh, would simplify something. And uh, of course, the last thing to the last visual thinking is uh, to not make it another mess, another level of hacks over existing architecture. So it would be, uh, can it can survive uh, more several more. Uh, tens of years without, uh, uh, I don't know, switching call servers to ARM or uh, uh, some other architecture. Uh, there is a question online, uh, are there any architectures that had atomic switching against NMI and false? I'm not sure what it means, atomic switching against NMI and false. Uh, typically, um, uh, uh, all modern architectures really um, uh, do not provide uh, complex uh, mode switching uh, hardware. They tend to provide you with facilities from which you construct uh, whatever you need it. Uh, so, no, I don't think there are such architectures, but uh, uh, other architectures really define NMI more strictly. For instance, if you block it NMI, then probably, well, either you can't block NMI or you can block NMI so that it can, nothing can interrupt it. I don't, I'm really not sure about it. Um. Maybe we should discuss this later after the talk. So uh, problem, uh, uh, the talks about this problem actually happened for several years and uh, uh, both Intel and AMD uh, not that uh, people are unhappy with this significant aspect of the architecture and both Intel and AMD started to formulate some answer to it. And this is really interesting uh, development in the um, history of uh, x86 because it uh, changes something very fundamental and very uh, high impacting both the performance and security of the platform. So uh, it started when uh, some publicity about it started when AMD published some very pre preliminary and uh, very unpolished paper. For instance, uh, there were simply no bits or MSR numbers allocated for facilities that they described. And it was surprising why they did it in that rush. But apparently Intel, uh, following several days, Intel now published their response. It is called flexible return and event delivery thread. I have no absolutely uh, 
know inside what why it is called this way. But uh, it seems that Intel developed it at least for several years because uh, emulation of this facility is already available for Intel CMIX. I don't have access to it, but uh, I saw the finite, uh, the finite statements that it is there. And uh, uh, Fred is uh, uh, mostly fi a finished extension to the architecture. It, uh, it is, uh, uh, I, I would be not surprised if some nearby uh, hardware would already provide the Fred facilities for us and we can use it. So uh, what is uh, FRED? FRED is, uh, defines several uh, things and uh, change, uh, uh, again, change several things to make architecture more logical and uh, easier to use for the operating system. So first FRED, uh, defines an extended hardware context. It is everything that Fred uh, can handle on the modus switching. What is it? It is uh, the same thing CS3 processor as per flux as uh, handled by existing modus switching, but it also adds the TLS base and uh, something called stack level. Um, stack level is uh, two bits that is a value from zero to three, it is considered as a replacement for IST. I will explain how it works somewhat later. And uh, what Fred provides, it changed event delivery and the return from events. It guarantees uh, atomic switching of the context that I uh, listed above. It provides the stack levels and it uh, switch, uh, removes the existing problem of IST where you can't use uh, the same, uh, for the, when you can't handle same faults that uh, uh, use IST because they override the, um, um, they override the each other frames. It, uh, uh, provides, I don't know why, but it provides uh, two entry points, one for user and one, one for kernel. Uh, it is uh, um, currently when we have uh, EDT, we have uh, 256 entry points by type of interrupt and exception, but they are common for user and kernel. And Fred, instead you have only two entry points and they're separated for user and kernel. I'm not sure why they did this way, because you can infer both event and mod at which event was generated from the saved context and thread, but okay, it's how they define it. So, uh, oh, there is some question, uh, question from Peter Grichem. Does Fred permit stack switching for NMI and double faults? Yes, Fred, I will talk about it right now. Stack, uh, stack uh, switching is very flexible in Fred and um, I will explain it. I will explain it in five minutes uh, after I explain what is stack level and how it is uh, configured and used for events. There are four stack levels. Stack level is part of the context and for each stack level, you have the pointer to the top of the stack configured into hardware. There is some MSR that you write and which contains the stack base. Um, events from user mode start with the current stack level of minus one effectively. Uh, for each event, you can specify the stack level. For instance, for each uh, exception, for each of 32 exception, you must specify which uh, stack level, new stack level should be used. So you can specify your own stack level for NMI, for double faults, for whatever events uh, you get. Uh, if uh, uh, CSL, changes, current stack level changes, then um, uh, the top of the new stack is used. Uh, 
Otherwise, if event is configured to not change the CSL, then uh, hardware allows to use red zone, red zone on the stack, but uh, effectively it just decrements current RSP by predefined value, then uh, subtract the space needed to save the current context, align to 46, sorry, 64 bytes and write the current context. If, uh, uh, how, again, how is defined whether the uh, CSL changes it not? It is written in the uh, event uh, description bits that exist in the MSR, newly defined MSR. So what it does, it provides us with uh, a way to nest the interrupt and event uh, exception handle, handlers without stamping on each other stacks. It is not a mistake to uh, handle lower event. For instance, if you defined uh, NMI as having the uh, stack level four and you have, a, a, I don't know, general protection fault occurring in the handler, then it is fine to um, handle this event. It will be handled with event level, with stack level four. It will just reuse the existing uh, stack for NMI. But I suspect that uh, really NMI should be, I didn't so hard about uh, how to really level all our current events, but I suspect that NMI should be set to level, for instance, one or two and uh, uh, faults that we cannot uh, delay handling, for instance, general protection faults or uh, segment faults that can occur due to bugs should have the lowest level um, stack. But uh, it is uh, all that should be designed and uh, fixed during the development. I didn't thought about it. Um, So how the actual uh, Fred frame looks at the stack? Fred selects the new stack, then uh, aligns it as needed, uh, and then writes the current conte context on the stack. What consists of the Fred frame? It actually consists of the uh, 64 bytes, they probably decided to write the, uh, to write out the full um, uh, cache lines out to the stack. And the new context consists of the um, exact, almost exactly old 40 bytes, that is SS, RSP, RFLUX, CS, RIP that currently are currently written to the stack, but also it has a predefined space that uh, might contain, might not, but it's always always written with error, with the vector that initiated the event, uh, current value for CR2 or DR6 registers, that CR2 is the uh, address of the current uh, page fault. So they always uh, write it out. And again, we don't stomp on the CR2 register if we have nested page folds, which is also very good. And uh, they also added some additional stuff. The, for instance, they write out current stack level in the space that was previously on used on the, in the uh, frame. And also they provide the uh, state of the, um, uh, state of the machine that was invisible uh, with the previous event delivery. For instance, N there, by, uh, bit 16, uh, specifies where the uh, NMI were blocked when event was delivered. So we have a direct visibility of NMI state at the event uh, which, caused, which caused the uh, machine transition. Uh, 
Also, we have a visibility into the uh, interrupt shadow, and, and we have some classification of the event that caused uh, the switch. We have vector, we have bit S that specifies that event happens at the uh, enclave uh, SGX uh, uh, security mode execution. We have uh, event type, which is exactly the same as the VMX exit reason that is written out as during the write out. And we have interrupt shadows also uh, written explicitly in the state. So we have a much more, <coughs> much more visibility into machine state. And of course, it is used during the return. We have two new return extraction. All the IRED simply doesn't work in the thread mode. We have return to supervisor and we have to return to user. And uh, both instructions take all context into consideration. So for instance, if you have an MI bit uh, blocked in the save it context, then you can you uh, return with NMI blocking into the uh, returning context. So you can explicitly manage the NMI stack and NMI state. And similarly, you can manage the uh, interrupt shadowing and whatever else is written there. So it all looks quite good. We have uh, uh, more at atomicity, so we don't have to handle the uh, tear it uh, apart context in the uh, fault handlers for things like general protection fault or st uh, stack fault. And uh, uh, we have also other perks that are defined by uh, architecture. Uh, for instance, uh, there is no interrupt shadowing when we enter kernel mode uh, and so on. It is all written down in the thread specification and actually it is it looks very promising. The only downside of course is that we would need to uh, a two instance of the uh, entry code, we would need the interrupt handler and we need to interrupt handler for all the detail based system and we need to interrupt handler for new thread based system. IMD um, in the paper, I will very shortly uh, note what uh, happened there. Uh, IMD just patched the architecture, they provide, they say that we will not allow interrupt shadowing, we will uh, handle JS base in C center and we add the blocking for the IDT entry. Basically, they have a mode, they introduce a mode where instead of uh, uh, stomping on the stack, you would get a double fault from the already busy event. Um, um, so it is a small addition to the existing architecture. And basically, if both AMD and Intel would go the route, then we would need to have three interrupt, different uh, interrupt and inception handlers, one for old architecture, one for FRED, and one for AMD. Uh, I have a question, um, Manu. How painful will it be to handle both Intel FRED and AMD SE? Basically, it means that we need to, as I said just now, we would need to have three different interrupt handlers. So it will be three low level uh, is separated three low level uh, assembler uh, uh, parts that work in each mode. Uh, I put the exact references to the uh, architecture papers and Intel AMD papers describing all this stuff. Um, the last note that I have, I, uh, I didn't get a uh, hand with CMYX that would be able to emulate FRED. And uh, actually, I'm somewhat leery to start implementation of uh, Fred just with CMYX because I already have a bad experience with uh, uh, five level paging for Intel, which I implemented. And uh, there is something in Quemo that is handled differently than in uh, real hardware. And in real hardware, it actually 
doesn't work and I need to find the machine that I cannot find to debug it. So I'm somewhat uh, way, um, don't want to start it too early. Uh, that's basically it. I uh, over time, of course, but I think not too much. No, um, we, that, was, <clears throat> that was a very good talk, uh, Constantine. Thank you. There were a lot of interest on IRC. Um, I think I saw at least three or four people say that they will need to rewind the talk and watch it a few more times so they can have it all sink in. I know um, there's a lot of subtleties in what you talked about. Um, I was going through my head of at least three or four security advisories we've published due to some of the things you've talked about with getting GS space wrong or the one with I with um, Sysret and Intel and AMD doing things differently. So very interesting. And, and Fred is very interesting. So we'll see how this goes. So thank you a whole bunch for your talk. Um, I don't think I see other questions. So let's go ahead and do our first break for the day for about five minutes. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about ARM64 on VMware. Thanks again, Scott Costic. Thank you. Bye. Testing video recording with audio. All right, let's see how this goes. Happy to talk to you all. No, oh, I see.
Okay, good. welcome back everybody. Our next talk for today is going to be Vincent talking about virtualization with ARM64. So I'll now turn it over to Vincent. Howdy. Um, so first off, I apologize if there's a little bit of noise. Um, living in the middle of downtown Seattle, there's a lot of uh, building construction going on. There's a new apartment being placed like just a few feet over to the side of me. So hopefully that won't be too much of a distraction here. Um, let's bring that up and let's go bring up the slides. Let's see, can uh, you see the slides okay? Yep. All right, perfect. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I'm Vince. Um, I play around a lot with uh, uh, a lot of different uh, ARM technologies, uh, virtualization specifically lately. Um, let me bring up the, my secondary window here. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> um, you can find me on you know Twitter at you know DarkHanimex. Um, I've been a very active user in our Discord uh, pretty much since the day it was started. So you'll just see me listed under my name as Vince with the dark in parentheses. So there's, you know, the disambiguous, um, you know, with a recent move to liberate chat, um, I'm dark on there. So if you ever see me on there, um, you know, feel free to say hi. Um, I do a lot of the stuff mostly just, um, with the FreeBSD stuff as a hobby right now, but I'm exploring, you know, what the possibilities are to bring it into the day job, uh, with arms specifically, obviously it's, um, been more cost effective than x86. So it's, it's very, very intriguing. But we got to uh, get the, the software there. Um, I may use the terms ARM64 and ARCH64 interchangeably. Um, uh, part of that is because ARM64 can um, just at a glance look like AMD64 and cause some confusion. And ARCH64 stands for ARM architecture 64 bit. So um, the, the two terms are basically you know, one and the same for the, the purpose of this talk. <clears throat> so. At a quick high level, uh, virtualization is basically you take your computer and you cut up the resources on it. And uh, it allows you to install more than one operating system on a single physical piece of hardware. Um, I'm gonna, um, right now I'm talking at a high level, but I'm gonna get more to the nitty gritty in just a second. I just wanna make sure that you know everyone's clear like what we're talking about here is um, with uh, virtualization. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> I also want to talk a, a quick brief history on virtualization just to show like how long this has been around and how quickly it's now accelerating all of a sudden because it's been kind of stagnant for a while. Now, all of a sudden in the past few years, it's it's really kind of blown up into this really uh, cool new uh, stuff uh, for it. Um, what we currently know of is virtualization pretty much came onto the market with VMware Workstation for um, 386 systems back in 1999. Um, some of these dates may be a little bit fuzzy based on what you know news sources I can pull from, but they're they're going to be close enough to to accurate. Um, as some of the dates may have been for you know uh, you know beta versions or versus production versions, whatnot. Uh, in 2004, uh, VMware um, introduced their 64-bit uh, line of products, so that was their workstation, their server products. You know, the they had a whole slew of them. Um, around uh, 2014, FreeBSD introduced the uh, Beehive hypervisor for uh, AMD64, which is, um, you know, really cool and interesting. Uh, but dealing with the ARM architecture stuff, uh, the first real big hypervisor to hit the market was AWS with Graviton uh, around 2018. And so that, that's been um, like a good cost saving feature for those of us uh, working with, uh, you know, cloud native, um, you know, deployments and, you know, uh, with uh, Amazon. <clears throat> but today I'm primarily only gonna be talking about uh, the two most recent uh, releases, which is VMware ESXi ARM Fling, which was released in October, and then Parallels Desktop for the, uh, the new Apple M1 chips, which was released just shy of two months ago. So very, very recent stuff. And then trying to get FreeBSD to run on both of those. And basically, what the uh, the experience has been with uh, both of those. <clears throat> Continuing a bit with the history, though, uh, VM at uh, VM World uh, 2019, uh, they gave a, uh, some demos of uh, their hypervisor running on a Raspberry Pi, and they didn't really have too much to show for it at the time. They showed this is basically what the the local console looks like. There's not a whole lot you can do from a local console with uh, VMware. Most of it is designed to be web-based instead. 
So the, this was just showing like, hey, you know, we can boot up at least to this stage, but um, it was, I don't think they had too much of the actual virtualization working yet, but with a full year of development since then, they have since um, released the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, ESXi ARM fling. And this is their blog post on October 6th uh, doing the official announcement of the release. And they go on uh, to explain the difference between uh, what ARM processors are versus x86 and AMD64 processors. And they also go on to explain what their term fling actually means because flings for uh, VMware are not official products. They are more of uh, technical previews where they release um, like early builds to the community to get feedback. And uh, their feedback system has been uh, very, very nice, honestly. <clears throat> They've had, uh, they have forums, they have um, you know, bug trackers and whatnot. And uh, even some of the developers have just been very active on Twitter and other social media platforms. And uh, every single place that I've uh, reached out to them, I have gotten really good solid replies. Um, they've even helped a bit with uh, providing some of the technical notes about what I'm about to get into. They've been providing um, patches and bug fixes, both in their hypervisor as well as for FreeBSD itself to make sure that everything is nice and cohesive. <clears throat> uh, Parallels Desktop is, um, rather than a server-oriented uh, hypervisor, it is a desktop-oriented hypervisor, specifically for the Mac OS. And uh, uh, in mid-April, they released the hypervisor for the, uh, the Mac M1 processors, so the, the new ARM processors from Apple. And so, the difference between here and VMware is that for Parallels, it is not a beta or a trial. This is a full release product at this point. <clears throat> so it should have the, the notion of the, the quality and standards that go along with that. Uh, so software is useless without hardware. So for all of these tests that, that I've been running, um, there is a, a series of hardware that I've been playing with. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 4 is was one of the primary targets for ESXi Arm Fling because they wanted to get it into hands of you know hobbyists and consumers as quickly and easily as possible. And this is by far and away the easiest board um, Arm system to get your hands on. Uh, for uh, these tests, um, I have installed ESXi Arm Fling on it. And I've also installed uh, FreeBSD on bare metal. Both of them run you know, relatively well. There's a few gotchas here and there, which I'll get into. Uh, for ARM Fling specifically, it requires either the four gig or the eight gig model due to the amount of RAM that the hypervisor takes. Hypervisor takes a, uh, just a little over one gig of RAM, but they didn't want to have that on a two gig board because that would just leave you with maybe half a gig left for like a single virtual machine, which really isn't that great of an experience. Uh, other ARM boards do work, like the, um, the RK3399, I believe that's the right number, with at least four gigs of RAM. <clears throat> and there's a whole slew of other boards that they support, too. That's just one that I know off the, the top of my head. And I believe we have it working on the, um, the Pi 400 now as well, which is the basically a Raspberry Pi 4 integrated into a keyboard. <clears throat> uh, this is my personal, uh, what I call the Pi Rack. So I have a cluster of 12 different Pis here uh, doing all different tasks. And most of them are Raspberry Pi 4s running uh, ESXi Arm Fling. And then I have a few other Pis here that are running uh, either bare metal or um, usually bare metal FreeBSD of uh, different versions to do uh, various levels of regression testing and um, uh, with uh, some of the ports that I, I'm involved with. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Uh, the bigger board that I play with is the Solid Run Honeycomb uh, LX2. Uh, again, this is running either ESXi Arm Fling uh, on it or running FreeBSV uh, bare metal. And this board is really interesting because the amount of different hardware that it has on it. So we have a 16 core processor sitting right here, which is you know <clears throat> a fairly respectable amount of uh, compute power. Uh, it uses a pair of uh, SODIMM slots, so the same RAM that you get from a laptop, and uh, what I'm using personally is RAM that I pulled out of a laptop when I upgraded a laptop last year. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's an ITX form factor, so it'll work in normal uh, computer cases, ITX or ATX cases usually. Uh, it uses a normal ATX 24-pin power adapter. Uh, it has four SATA ports, so 
standard storage, storage you can think of. Um, uh, an eight lane uh, PCI Express slot. There is a four lane uh, M.2 for NVMe. And in my case, I have that populated with a, um, a 16 gig uh, Intel Optane drive. And for the SATA ports, I have a pair of uh, five terabyte uh, hard drives attached to it that are running a ZFS mirror for my uh, bare metal FreeBSD. Uh, there is a one gig NIC and, a, and four 10 gig NICs. However, there's no drivers available for that yet. We're still waiting for the, uh, the vendor to provide uh, technical specs on those. Um, so whether it's FreeBSD or ESXi, and I don't think Linux, neither of those have the drivers, and I don't think Linux has the drivers yet either. It's still, this is still pretty much a, considered a development board, not really ready for uh, production networking uh, usage. So a lot of my networking, I'm using the PCI Express slot with uh, my own network cards, which having that slot means that I have that capability. <clears throat> And of course, because I like to uh, bling things out here as my personal uh, you know, uh, uh, honeycomb system uh, sitting inside of uh, a case with lots of uh, really pretty uh, RGB LEDs to keep it nice and cool, even though it doesn't need that level of cooling. But as you can see here in the PCI Express slot down at the bottom, uh, I have a dual uh, 10 gig NIC. It's an uh, Emulex uh, OCE, I forget the exact number, but it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the OCE NIC, which is nice to know that uh, drivers that were written for uh, AMD 64 are working effortlessly with uh, with ARM at this point. Uh, the other piece of hardware that I'm testing with is a MacBook Air 2020, the the new M1. Uh, because this is running uh, Mac OS, it can only run a Parallels desktop right now. Um, <clears throat> Picture is the MacBook Pro. I personally have the MacBook Air. I don't have any photos of it because the uh, it's not as exciting as my Pyrac or the uh, the colorful honeycomb that I have. So sorry, no personal photos of it this time. Uh, so now we're going to get into the, the technical details. So there's a lot of virtual hardware to go along with the physical hardware. And the virtual hardware is, is what's most important to FreeBSD because we need to have the, um, the kernel and driver support for all the different virtual hardware. So the first thing up, uh, uh, basically these are going to be in the order of discovery. Can you still hear me there? My headset just died. Yep, we can hear you. OK, yeah, my, my, my headset died there. All right, it's a wireless headset. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, these are going to be in the order of basically discovery of after installing FreeBSD, what order uh, did we discover these different issues in? So the very first thing, um, surprisingly, both Parallels and ESXi ARM Fling had the exact same issue with um, doing more than one CPU core. And it turned out to be a uh, discrepancy in the interpretation of the ARM hardware docs for uh, the inner process interrupts. Um, so uh, based on the way the docs have been you know, reread and discussed since then, um, it's been determined that um, the patches can be applied to both the hypervisor and to the operating system. So that way it uh, disambiguates um, the state of that particular uh, register on, on the system. So the patch has since been applied to ESXi ARM Fling version 1.3, which is the current version. Uh, the patch is currently in testing with Parallels Desktop 17. Uh, the patch is in FreeBSD current 14. And last night when I checked, it had yet to be backported to 13. And I hope that it will. Uh, D26975 is the, the review. It's just one line of code. So that's something, if we can get that in 13, that means that we don't have to wait all the way till 14 if somebody's using a hypervisor that doesn't have that patch yet to make sure that we can have more than one virtual processor. Because that's when uh, looking at posts on social media, that's been the number one thing that people have noticed is that either A, they're starting it up in real life and they, it, you get through the boot process and it just stalls waiting for that interrupt and um, users are just giving up at that point. Or I try to reply like, hey, drop down to one virtual CPU for now and then you'll be able to full boot as we're you know, figuring this issue out. Um, so that's been a, a point of contention with uh, users trying out FreeBSD uh, right off the bat. Uh, the next is uh, storage. Uh, so SATA worked perfectly right at launch. That, that was great. Um, there were pre-made images for uh, VMDKs or for raw disk images. 
And initially, that's what we had to use to get uh, FreeBSD working on ESXi. Um, by the time Parallels came out, all of this has been fixed. But uh, for uh, ESXi, um, at launch, the CD-ROM driver was missing. That meant if you uh, attach the um, the ISO image to the virtual CD-ROM drive when you booted it up, and the um, the BIOS handed the boot process over to the kernel to say, hey, you know, it, use your driver to to continue reading from the the CD-ROM disk. The kernel uh, didn't know how to mount the the disk and would just stall indefinitely at that point. Um, funny enough, the CD-ROM driver was already in review to be added to the generic kernel at that point uh, for a uh, one of the server boards because it had an optional uh, CD-ROM, even though usually people have been installing the OS through USB. And so with ESXi having a very set use case for this, it was able to fast track getting that into the uh, ARM generic kernel. Um, PV SCSI was another one that was missing that has since been uh, added. Um, there's been some bugs back and forth with ESXi on that, where PV SCSI could not be booted from, and that's uh, since been fixed in uh, 1.3. Uh, NVMe booting ha had a similar issue uh, booting, and that's mostly been fixed, but there's been a secondary bug that they weren't aware of, so it's still not fully working. Uh, basically, their uh, virtual EFI inside of the virtual machine um, only would boot from SATA or uh, USB, or, or not USB, um, SATA or the CD-ROM. So their their virtual BIOS didn't know how to boot from PV SCSI or from NVMe. So they just had to write basically an uh, uh, updated boot code on their um, their virtual EFI. So yeah, and the the hacky things that were needed until the CD-ROM driver is that um, like for the raw image. Uh, for the there was a raw image for the installer. Uh, I converted that from raw to VMDK. But then when you put the VMDK on the server, the VMDK is the uh, workstation version. And on server, it needs yet another conversion. And then you mount that as a second hard drive uh, inside of the virtual machine. And then you boot from that hard drive to install to the first hard drive. And it was this long, complicated process just to be able to do a manual install if you wanted to use ZFS rather than the pre-made uh, UFS images. Uh, uh, USB hardware has been kind of interesting. Um, the very next thing, if you start playing around with USB a lot, you'll notice that you can, e uh, at least in the early days, you'd easily break your keyboard and mouse, especially the keyboard, um, because there's no PS2 on, uh, on ARM at all. So on x86, if you didn't have uh, USB drivers in your kernel, um, it would just fall back to PS2 and the kernel would pick it up perfectly. Uh, on ARM, that's there is no option for that. You have to have USB no matter what. At launch, there was a couple of the HCI drivers. I think it was EHCI, possibly. I can't remember exactly which ones were missing. Um, but they're now all included. Uh, all of the various USB controllers are now included. Because uh, initially with ARM, the drivers were being included one off at a time based on boards that people were testing. And then with the uh, VMware, it was uh, determined that we should just have all of the various USB controllers going forward at this point. Um, right now, there's still a couple issues with mount, the mouse support. So the UMS, the USB mouse driver, is not automatically loaded. Uh, I just tested that last night. And that um, still needs to be added to your loader.com for the mouse to work properly. Um, so I'm not sure why that's not being detected, because it does detect that there is a device there. But it's not loading the uh, the USB driver, the USB mouse driver specifically. Also, right now, because it requires the SVGA driver, which I'll get to in a second, um, we don't have that smooth transition of the mouse in and out of the window when you're in a desktop environment in a VM. So you still have to use the keyboard combination to um, unlock your um, uh, how it kind of like captures your mouse and keyboard input. You still have to use the keyboard combination to to uh, unlock from that. <clears throat> Uh, networking, uh, VMware by default uses the E1000 series, uh, you know, Intel drivers, and that was already included in uh, FreeBSD, so that worked great. Uh, there was the VMXNet driver, which for good reason was not included initially with uh, uh, the ARM um, generic kernel. That's because there was no VMware hypervisor until like th this one launched, right? And so just simply adding it, it worked perfectly with no modification whatsoever. That was a really easy fix. Uh, for Parallels Desktop, it uses the VertIO uh, VTNet driver. And that just worked perfectly with no modification at all. So we had great networking there um, right on day one. 
Uh, audio has been kind of a little interesting thing because I never even thought to test it because I've mostly been dealing with uh, server stuff. I haven't really touched too much of the, uh, the, the desktop space of things. Um, but I went back and retested this just to, to validate this. Right now, there's no real audio support on ESXi ARM Fling. And the reason for it is because uh, just a VMware in general, when you're dealing with the uh, ESXi versions, their server versions, they don't have audio support over their uh, their remote um, the remote protocol that they use. So until we get VMware Fusion on the M1, which would work as a desktop hypervisor rather than a bare metal hypervisor, uh, we really won't know what their audio support is gonna be like. Uh, in that regards, um, based on all of the chatter I've seen on social media, uh, we should be getting a tech preview of Fusion uh, pretty much any day now, it looks like. Um, and they're talking about having it fully released by the end of the year. So there'll be more uh, to update on that really soon. Um, just because I was screwing around with it, uh, I was um, tried installing a FreeBSD desktop on a Parallels desktop VM and found that it was missing the uh, high definition audio driver. And so we have the bug ID uh, 256.204 uh, where we're discussing the best way to load that driver automatically. Manually loading the driver, audio worked perfectly. I was playing uh, YouTube clips, and there was no audio stuttering whatsoever. Um, and since there was no SVGA driver, uh, even the video playback had to use software decoding rather than hardware decoding. And even with that extra pressure on the processor, there was no issues whatsoever uh, with audio playback. It just worked flawlessly first try. It was really nice. Uh, video, uh, so the SVGA uh, drivers, uh, we're kind of up in the air right now. Um, talking with the developers over at uh, VMware for theirs, uh, they're working on a new uh, virtual video card uh, right now. Uh, it has a new um, PCI ID, so the other driver won't even detect it. Uh, the hardware spec is different. Uh, my personal uh, speculation is that they're, um, they're working on Vulkan support um, because the existing driver had OpenGL support and DirectX support, so you can do uh, 3D gaming and you know the 3D desktop different uh, uh, features with it. It wasn't fully performant, but it was much, much better than doing it in software. So I can only assume at this point that they're making a new one for Vulkan, but I could be wrong. It's just personal speculation. So right now, uh, we're using the, the EFI frame buffer, and that's why the mouse capture uh, doesn't work yet, because it requires the two drivers to communicate with each other. And for um, the parallels, I've not looked into what they use for a video system, but so far, just a default install uses the EFI frame buffer as well. Uh, I don't know what they use for um, uh, on their Intel systems. I'm not sure what they used for a video driver there anyway, since I've never used parallels up until this point and haven't had the chance to research that. Uh, for other hardware, there's the VMCI driver. Uh, it's virtual machine communication interface, I think is what that stands for. It's so two VMs have a high performance interface for communicating back and forth. So something faster than going through the virtual network stack. And right now it contains a bunch of x86 assembly and I'm not sure if that's even supported on ESXi arm fling yet. Um, I haven't tested it. I haven't looked into the, the assembly code or doing any rewriting of that. Uh, I don't even know any software that uses the VMCI interface. It's something I've personally not used, so that's going to be something we'll have to uh, look at in the, the future at, at some point. I don't know when. Uh, some quick limitations. These are notes that the, uh, the VMware devs gave me. Uh, VMotion, which is the ability to migrate a virtual machine from one host to another. Uh, if they're the same, exact same system, so a Raspberry Pi to a Raspberry Pi, it should work. Um, I believe I have actually tested that and it did work in my case, but going from, let's say a Pi to a honeycomb, even though they're both uh, Cortex A72 processors, they're not the same A72 processor. Uh, something with ARM spec is that uh, each manufacturer can turn on and off different optional uh, features in the processor. And so that, that's causing some issues with getting that same level of consistency we have on x86 right now, where let's say an Intel Skylake is an Intel Skylake and we know that. And so being able to go between two Skylake systems is um, it's the same generation processor, so it'll work, but we don't have that flexibility in ARM yet. Um, possibly ARM V9 may address some of this because I believe they're locking down part of the standard on what's optional and what's not. So um, we'll have to wait and see. 
And also another note that they gave me is that currently none of the CPUs they've tested apparently support nested virtualization. So that's something else that we're not going to be able to play with just yet. Maybe V9 um, or a future ARM spec will have that capability. Uh, getting into the, the software side of things, um, there is the ports for Parallels tools. Uh, this one is very, very simp simple to change. It's bug 256 279. And <clears throat> uh, it, all it required was telling the, the port uh, what that ARM64 is 64-bit. That's it. A very simple change, and it just worked. Uh, I'm not sure how to test it. Yeah, I'm not too sure on how to test that one, um, just because uh, I'm not familiar with what all Parallels tools do. Um, it seems to be maybe just, as it says there, the file is PVM net, so some sort of network driver, possibly. But they're using ver IO, so this may not even be something that they use anymore. This could just be some old dead code at this point. Uh, Open VM tools um, was quite a bit more complex because it is a much, much larger tool set, required significant amount of change. So there's um, that's being tracked under 256, 282. Uh, these changes from um, everything that I've done should be live upstream at this point, but they have not pushed a, uh, a new release since all of these changes were made. So if you're using the current version of uh, VMware tools, the current released version, uh, you'll need all of these patches, which is what that, that bug references. So if we want to get this into ports, because there's still no word on when they're releasing a new version of VMware tools or the open VM tools, uh, um, we have the option to bring this into ports now, or we either wait, we, we either bring it in now using these patch sets, or we wait until the next official release upstream happens, and we use that instead. Um, uh, this one has been validated, tested, working, everything like that. So with uh, OpenVM tools, uh, it passes information from the client to the uh, the hypervisor. Here, let me shut my window. They're doing really noisy. All right. So it passes information from the uh, client to the hypervisor. So it shows the IP address, the host name, um, which version of the tools you're running, as well as a bunch of information uh, on storage. And so you can see how I have basically two different ZFS pools going on right now, one for the root file system and another one for my MariaDB instance. And uh, a lot of the work I do is surrounding around uh, uh, MariaDB. Uh, so what's really cool with all of this is that there is what's called vSphere. And that allows you to manage multiple uh, uh, VMware uh, ESXi hosts uh, all from a single dashboard. And with this particular uh, vSphere instance, I'm running uh, or I'm managing systems in multiple home labs right now. So I have you know, my home lab here in Seattle, and then I have different family member houses and friends' houses where I've set up some home labs as well. But also, uh, I'm managing both x86 and ARM from the same vSphere uh, uh, server at this point. So you can see here where I have my ARM cluster another ARM cluster, and then two x86 clusters there on the left with a, uh, a whole assortment of hosts underneath, underneath each of them with um, the virtual machines underneath that. I can just at a glance see um, what the status of uh, any of these machines are, you know, what they're doing. Um, I can go into their consoles. I can add VMs. I can remove VMs, power them up, you know, power them down, whatever I need to do. Uh, you can see that under my ARM cluster, there's two machines currently broken. Uh, that's very intentional currently. One of them is my solid run machine. One of them is the Raspberry Pi 4 gig unit, which uh, I used for the testing, which I'll get to in just a second. Uh, some of the testing that I actually use with all of this, um, you may have noticed the name uh, Zero Tier in a lot of those virtual machines. So the reason why the virtual machines are really important is it allows us to do a lot of regression testing and compatibility testing, um, especially around ports, which is where I spend most of my time. Uh, Zero Tier is a software-defined networking stack that I use very extensively. And as you can see here, I have my uh, like ARM64 on FreeBSD 12.2 12, 12 at the top. Um, there's ARM v6, ARM v7. Um, I have some i386, um, and all of these machines are all 
sharing one software defined network regardless of their architecture, which is really, really nice. Uh, and you can see specifically, I have a test instance up here where it notes that this commit broke. Uh, I was trying to figure out exactly where a particular patch in um, zero tier upstream broke only on FreeBSD ARM. And so I was able to spin up multiple instances and have them running at multiple different uh, versions of zero tier simultaneously, which you can see the versions on the right over here to try to gauge where, um, where the regression actually happened. And I can compare them all in real time just by spinning up multiple VMs without av having to touch the physical hardware. Uh, I do this a lot for testing 12 versus 13 versus 14 with some of these ports and being able to jump between those versions without having to, like with the Raspberry Pi, I don't need to pull out the SD card. I don't need to pull out the USB drive. I can just have all of those booted and running simultaneously in parallel now. Um, and that's really sped up the ability to debug regression testing. Um, so I also did uh, a bunch of benchmarking. Uh, if you've been following my Twitter, you've probably seen me rant about that all week this uh, this week, especially with everything that went wrong with it, <laughs> which I'll get into in a bit. Um, for the Pi 4, I used a four or I used an eight gig model with ESXi ARM fling. Um, for bare metal, I used a four gig the four gig model. Uh, for the honeycomb, again, I'm using uh, ESXi ARM fling, and then I ran it bare metal as well. And then I had the, the MacBook uh, M1 running Parallel 17 beta. All of these running, um, all of these are running FreeBSD 13 release. So um, no patching, no security, just the the 13 release. That way everything had the exact same version. It was uh, easier to manage. Uh, all of the virtual machines had four gigs of uh, VRAM in them. Uh, with this, uh, that was more than enough RAM to do the uh, to do a build kernel. Uh, without ever swapping, it uses at most about two gigs of RAM to do that. So there's still headroom left over for um, like the ARC and other things to, to kick in with ZFS. Um, and then I had the four gig Raspberry Pi um, for the bare metal testing to match the RAM size uh, of the VMs. And then for the honeycomb, I had 16 gigs of RAM just because that's what it physically has. And I don't have a, any four gig sticks to shove into it to do smaller testing. So I just left it as is. Uh, for ZFS, um, this is usually just what I use for uh, my build environments because how easily they are to reproduce. So I turn off uh, sync. Um, I set a time off. I set record size to one meg and I set compression to LZ4. That way I can focus on just the compute aspect of things. Um, with sync disabled, uh, the Git repository, I can just reclone or update whatever I need to do. So if, if that failed, that's easy to reproduce. And if a build failed, um, because you know the machine lost power or whatever, I can rebuild it. That's not a big deal. Uh, a time, of course, you just always have that off. Uh, record size set to one meg. That uh, because most artifacts and the uh, either the source code or the objects that are built, you're going to be reading the entire artifact beginning to end, no matter what, um, during the compile process. So having a larger record size just makes that easier. And then compression, uh, especially with the embedded systems, because their storage is slower. That um, I did at times notice that storage was the limiting factor, not compute, depending on what uh, task I happen to be doing at the time. And then to pull the source code, I'm using uh, GitHub. Um, just because of where I'm situated, it's a very fast mirror for me. And I do uh, shallow cloning um, with a depth of one and specifically specify the release branch 13. So that way I'm only pulling down the code that I need without worrying about the entire tree of you know the, the full historical tree in Git or all of the other branches like 14 and everything else. I don't need all of that for the, the benchmarking. <clears throat> and now probably the most interesting and the most painful slide uh, for me to make, um, just running a build kernel. This is pretty much the only benchmark I was doing um, because I just wanted just a high level overview of the performance difference of virtualization versus uh, bare metal. And there's some, minor uh, issues here and there in terms of, again, storage performance, where the Raspberry Pi um, actually crosses over uh, um, based on the number of cores in use and how well it can interact with the storage for how well that performed. Um, and then we see the, the middle, line, middle lines here. That's the uh, solid run hu uh, honeycomb. 
And consistently, bare metal is just slightly faster than virtualization. So there's just a minor performance hit there. And that's a bit more what we'd expect from virtualization um, when you have good, solid, stable storage on both the VM and the host, which that did. On the Raspberry Pi, the storage, you know, using USB storage isn't the greatest and has the performance impacts. And I think that's part of what's uh, affecting those benchmarks. But then we get down to the M1 um, running, a, you know, there is no bare metal, just hypervisor. And this really highlights what Apple has done with their processor um, and their ARM technology is that their single core performance is nearly five times faster than the uh, solid run performance. And even if we get all the way down here to like the, the four core performance, we're still looking at about four times faster than the, the, the honeycomb. So, uh, and that's the honeycomb, you know, physical hardware versus a virtual machine running on a MacBook Air. And to note the, the MacBook specifically is that it can actually run faster than this. Uh, the Air has no active cooling and it was actually thermal throttling in these tests. The longer they ran, um, if I ran multiple tests in succession, it would get slower and slower and slower over time. Um, and this is about where uh, it leveled out at. So uh, this just really goes to show what Apple has done with their uh, their optimization and their performance that uh, even at a single core at you know full bursting potential is still in the realm of about uh, eight to 12 cores on the, the honeycomb. And so uh, I've moved a lot of my building um, and ports uh, development over to a virtual machine on there instead, just because of how much quicker I can compile and, and do my testing. It's It's been just night and day how, how well that's working now. Um, and then the, the last piece of information I have is the Raspberry Pi Oddity. This is what I've been complaining about on social media all week is that I kept getting these really, really long build times and I couldn't figure out why when dealing with physical hardware. And it turned out that um, using the pre-built Raspberry Pi image, uh, it does not have PowerD running by default. And the Pi would default to its lowest power state of 600 megahertz rather than the 1500 megahertz. Um, uh, because of that, it just ran really, really slow. And I had no idea why. It took me three days to figure that out. And so a, um, I, I think at this point, it would be advantageous for the board specific images that we build, such as the Raspberry Pi image, that we now start including PowerD by default, because otherwise um, users are just going to download the image and not know about this issue. They're going to run it and they're going to say, oh, this is you know significantly slower than my comparable Linux image that I run on it. And that's a chance for pushing people away from FreeBSD, thinking that the operating system um, has some serious issue with it, when in reality, it's just the, the power management and the power states aren't um, actively being managed as they should. And that's just as simple, you know, just adding the service to um, in your RC conf and that's it. So that's um, about it for what I have for today. Um, special thanks to the VMware development team. They have been very responsive. Uh, any question I have, they've been very quick and, and easy to get a hold of. They've uh, they've provided a lot of information, especially for these slides. Uh, they've been doing um, patches and fixing things um, very quickly. Um, and then we have Ed from the FreeBSD Foundation. He's been great at pushing through all the changes that we need, uh, making sure that uh, everything works. Uh, everything has been you know, stable. If there's uh, any drivers missing or if there's any code changes that need to be made, uh, he's been doing a great job of making sure those get um, reviewed very quickly. And of course, uh, all of you awesome people who've just been you know, part of the FreeBSD community because a lot of this code uh, that we're using on ARM already existed before this. Like especially the the PV SCSI and you know VMX net drivers, uh, all we had to do was turn those on and they they worked with no modification at all. And so a lot of this was just pre done. And right now we're just flipping flags and validating that it works. So that's been really really great. Um, so at this point, are there uh, any questions um, pending for this? I don't think I saw any on IRC. Um, but I think we also probably schedule wise, it'd be good if we go ahead and take a break. But thank you very much for your talk. Uh, that's really neat stuff.
Glad to see virtualization working with ARM64 on FreeBSD. Uh, so let's go ahead and take about a 10 minute break. When we come back, we'll have Matt Ahrens talking about RAID Z expansion. Thanks again, Vincent. All right, thank you.
Hi, all. Welcome back for our next session of our third day of the FreeBSD Developer Summit. Um, one thing I'd encourage you during breaks and so forth, if you're not stretching your legs or doing something like that, you can feel free to go hang out in the hallway track. We were talking a little bit, um, just various thoughts and chit chat. So it's a great place to just go do a little bit of the social part of being at our conference. Uh, but our next talk is going to be from Matt Ahrens talking about RAID-Z expansion. So I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Awesome, thanks. Um, let me get my screen sharing. Let's do that. Screen sharing is coming. All right, Are you, hopefully you're seeing my slides now. Cool. Yeah. So uh, I'm Matt Aarons. I'm here to talk to you about uh, ZFS RAID Z expansion. Um, I work for Delphix, and this work is sponsored by the FreeBSD Foundation. I'm actually seeing your whole desktop. Oh, all right. Then let me um, make sure that we're getting the right thing here. There we go. Better? Yes. OK. Awesome. So have you ever used ZFS? and been staring down a problem like this. You're using uh, RAID Z2 or, or some sort of RAID Z and uh, you're at basically full capacity, 95%. You have no free space and uh, you're sitting with a uh, drive that you'd like to add to it. You have additional storage, but it's just not in this pool um, and there's nothing you can do about it because you have to add disks to RAID Z in whole VDEV groups. So you're, you're sitting here thinking, ah, I, like, I have five disks. I wish I could add the six disk that I have. I don't have room or money for five new disks to make it 10. Um, what do I do? So to put it another way, you have a RAID Z pool with five disks in it. You want to add a sixth, di a sixth disk, expanding the pool's capacity. That's what this project does. So the solution uh, you can run now, well, once, once my code integrates, uh, you can run Z pool attach. Um, to add this new disk. So you, the way that you type it in is Z pool attach. The name of the pool here is test. The uh, VDEV that you're attaching to is RAID Z2-0. So RAID Z2 is the type and zero is the ID, which you can get from the Z pool status output down here. And then the new disk that I'm adding in this example is var time six. You can imagine it's like dev disk, uh, whatever. So you run that. Um, it does not complete instantaneously. Uh, so uh, there's some work that we need to do in the background. Um, and uh, so the, the command returns and then you can observe the background progress with uh, Z pool status. So it's gonna tell you here, um, you know, RAID Z expand is in progress. Uh, this is how much we've copied, 4,444 megabytes in this example, and the total amount, the rate and uh, estimated time of completion. And you can see that the new disk six here is part of the pool. Um, but the, uh, while this is in progress, your space available is still the same. So we have to wait for the uh, expansion to complete uh, before we actually can use the additional space. To do that waiting, uh, you can use the Z pool wait subcommand. After the uh, expansion completes, the Z pool status will reflect that. So now it says expansion completed. Um, the disk is part of the configuration. And now we have more space available. So in this case, we went from almost nothing to 600 megs. Um, and our capacity is now 77% instead of 95%. We have a bunch of free space. The size is larger. Um, so this is a good point to remind uh, folks uh, or inform folks that, that don't already know this, that um, the way that space usage is reported in ZFS, there's kind of two different ways to think of it. One is what space is allocated and what space is free. And this is reported in Z pool list. So this is really talking about like the low level uh, details of the, of the space allocator. Um, and uh, unfortunately this is featured somewhat prominently, you know, if you're using the Z pool command, but usually, you know, you really want to be looking at the available slash used, which is reported in ZFS list. This is talking about like how much logical space do we think you can actually write uh, before running out of space. So this is, it's kind of a guess um, because, you know, it might depend on a bunch of things, you know, compression, for example, um, and also the amount of parity used by RAID Z. So 
In particular with RAID Z, the parity, the space that's used for parity is part of the allocation. So the space that's used by the parity is included in the size and alloc and free here. But um, in ZFS list, uh, it is kind of ignored um, or abstracted away. So uh, the space available here is 600 megs. We, I think we added a uh, one gigabyte device in this kind of trivial example. And 600 megs uh, more like usable space is available now. All right. So um, hopefully that was like uh, exciting that it can happen, but also boring that like there's, there, you know, you just type it and it does it and then you're done. Um, so uh, I thought that folks would be interested in how does this actually work? Um, and so we'll talk about, I'm going to talk the rest of the talk about kind of how this works and what the design implications are of, um, of those design decisions. So first off, um, we talked, you saw that like, it doesn't complete instantaneously. Um, it has to do some work. What is, what is it doing? Uh, so we, we're changing the whole on-disk state. Uh, what does this on-disk state look like after the expansion completes? Um, so first let's take a, uh, a rewind a bit to how does traditional RAID do it? Um, so with traditional like RAID 4, 5, 6, the parity is at fixed locations. So in this example, I'm showing like RAID 4, where the parity is all on one disk. Um, and I'm using, in these diagrams, you'll see throughout the talk, the color indicates the parity group. So like this uh, orange P4 through 6 is the parity of uh, sectors 4, 5, and 6. Um, and uh, that's at a fixed location. So like if you change the data at, uh, at sector 5, then we have to re RAID, Z, RAID 4 has to recalculate it to, has to recalculate the parity there. Um, traditional RAID expansion, it does it by basically like reflowing the data, uh, but not reflowing the parity. So uh, you can see here, like this orange row, before it had the parity was of 4, 5, 6, but we've reflowed the data. So now the parity would have to be the parity of 5, 6, 7, 8. Um, but you know, this, this would work fine for traditional RAID. Uh, you have like, you know, you're 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 getting the the RAID five right hole, uh, you know, every, uh, all over the place because um, while you're in the middle of this, you know, you have to recalculate all these parities. You know, I hope you don't crash during the middle of it. <laughs> uh, RAID Z does not work that way. It it, fall, it has the same kind of idea of reflow, where like we're taking the sectors and we're kind of like renumbering them and moving them moving them from the old to the new locations. But with RAID Z the parity is like part of the allocation. Um, and when we are doing the reflow, we're, we are reflowing both data and parity. Um, so in this example, if you look at say this yellow um, row, uh, five is the parity of six, seven, eight. Um, after we reflow it, uh, we're moving all of those sectors, both data and parity, so five comes over here and five is still the parity of six, seven, and eight. So we're not changing what the parity is calculated of, um, which uh, has a bunch of benefits. Uh, and at least of which, um, you know, if you crash in the middle of this, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward to know where you are. We can atomically move it forward. Um, I see some questions, which I will get to when, um, when we get a break or perhaps I'll answer them. Uh, Perhaps the rest of my talk will answer them. We'll see. Um, cool. So uh, another cool thing about RAID Z expansion is that the reflow doesn't care where the parity is. So in this example, I, sh I showed that the parity all being on the first disk, but that's kind of like a contrived example, and that's not how it actually occurs with you know any real world layout. So you might have um, some smaller non-full stripe, uh, non-full width uh, parity groups. So, you know, five here is the parity of six uh, in practice, you know, that's just kind of like a mirror. Um, but in, in wider examples, you'd have all, all kinds of different sizes. Um, so in this case, uh, the reflow, like we're, we're, the numbers here are all exactly the same as they were on the previous slide. One, two, three, four, five in the first row, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in the second row. It's just that which ones happen to be parity and which ones happen to be data uh, are different, but RAID Z expansion doesn't need to know about that or care about that. Um, but uh, we can, um, and uh, 
it would be kind of hard to, to figure it out. If we needed to, we could find that information by going and traversing all of the block pointers in the pool, uh, but that would be pretty expensive. So, uh, but we can find what space is allocated and what space is free uh, really efficiently uh, from the space maps. So we only have to copy the actual data that was allocated. In this, in this example, I'm showing like 11 through 16 were not allocated. We don't have to copy them. We only have to copy the stuff that was allocated. So the cool thing about this is that, um, well, it works and we don't have to change or read the, or even read the block pointers. Um, the reads and writes happen sequentially. So, you know, in theory, they can go very fast. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we don't need to know where the parity is. Uh, and um, the segments are still on different disks. So redundancy is preserved. I'll get to that, uh, some examples of that in, in a minute. Cool. So um, after the expansion completes, then um, new writes can use the new stripe width. So in this case, uh, you know, we have 11 through 16 were not used, we didn't copy them. But then if we do a new write, we can allocate um, that whole 11 through 16, and we can have a new better data to parity ratio of, um, you know, in this case, four data sectors with one parity sector. Um, this has some implications. <laughs> um, I would come back to the difference between like used and allocated. Um, so the, the DMU's view of uh, what space is like logically used versus like what the allocator has allocated. Um, so uh, to make that uh, with RAID Z, you, know, you always have this kind of ratio uh, of like you're using some of the allocated space as parity, but we don't want that to show up in the use slash avail. So the way that that works in ZFS is there's like this presumed data to parity ratio. Um, which is calculated when you first uh, create the pool or create the VDIV, I should say. Um, and so uh, after the expansion, we're, we don't need to allocate quite as much parity for, for each piece of data on average. So you might find that the space used uh, is actually a little bit lower than you expected due to the improved data to parity ratio. Uh, oh, and... Um, because now we have blocks with different um, logical stripe widths, we need to know, uh, we need to be able to figure out like which logical stripe width it was. And we can do that by using the block's birth time, which is in the block pointer um, to determine like if it was written before slash during the expansion or, or written after the expansion with the new um, larger logical stripe width. Cool, so uh, that's a little bit of how it works. Um, we talked about like the end state that we want to be in. Uh, unfortunately, we can't just like stop all access to the pool, read the whole pool into memory, you know, re-jigger uh, everything, and then spot it all back out atomically. Um, that would be really nice uh, if we could. It, it would have made my life a lot easier. But unfortunately, you probably don't have that much RAM. Um, we want to, and so we want to be able to do this incrementally as we're processing the normal flow of reads and writes. Uh, so he, this is just a, uh, the same thing that we saw before, uh, a little bit bigger. Um, again, the colors indicating the uh, logical straight widths, which will come into play a little bit later. Um, so this is the desired end state. On the left is the beginning, uh, is what we start with. We want to have this end state on the right. How do we get from there here to there? So we start off by adding the new disk, and it's just empty, and everything is where it was before. And so um, we want to re reflow it by, you know, reading. So like we have to read logical sector number five and then write it over here, read sector six and then write it over here, et cetera, et cetera. Here's, so we're, we're doing this kind of in order. Uh, we get some possible intermediary, intermediary state here where we've copied um, up to sector 30 to the new location. And while we're in the middle of this, we want to preserve all of RAID Z's um, redundancy guarantees. So, you know, in this example, we're talking about RAID Z1, which means that you should be able to lose any one disk without losing any data. Um, so let's think about what happens if we lose this um, fourth disk. We're going to lose all that data. But um, if we, so if we think about this green stripe here, um, you know, it's going to have one piece of parity and three pieces of data. 
uh, and we can lose any one of them and be able to reconstruct it. But if we lose two of them, then uh, we cannot reconstruct it. We've lost that data. So uh, from what we see here, we've lost two pieces of that green stripe and um, we're, we're out of luck. That would not be good. So how do we deal with this? Um, the way that we deal with this is that we, um, we all, when we're doing a read of a split stripe, a stripe where part of it is in the new location and part of it is in the old location, um, we actually read the entire stripe from the old location. So, uh, you know, 29, 29, 30, 30, these, these should have the same exact contents, but it's still here in the old location. So uh, we can read from this, this version of 29 and 30. Um, and that way we have lost only one sector of this, uh, of this stripe. You know, this, uh, by stripe, I'm talking about like the, the parity and data that's associated with it. Um, the trick here is that we need to maintain enough separation between the old locations and the new locations so that we aren't like, we haven't, uh, 29 is still here. We haven't overwritten it yet. Um, so how do we do that? <laughs> Um, once you get far enough along, it's easy. Like you, you know, like if you're a gigabyte in, you know, the separation between the the new locations, the old locations, is really big, and so it's easy to avoid that. Um, and we can like issue lots of uh, concurrent reads and writes, and everything is fine because we can mess with that intermediate region um, to our heart's content until we uh, sync out the progress uh, as part of the TXG. But what about at the very beginning? So at the very beginning, like you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll show you more later. At the very beginning, we're stuck with copying one sector at a time, right? Like we have to take five from here and put it here. We can't take six and put it in its new location like at the same time because five is still there. We still got to read that. And we would end up with not enough separation to guarantee that the each stripe uh, can be read from its old location. So um, the, the trick here is, uh, we, we do that, you remember when I said it would be nice if we could just like atomically slurp everything into memory and then splat it back out again. Uh, that's what we do for the very beginning of the, um, uh, at the very beginning of the expansion. So uh, we read in the first, uh, basically like the width squared number of sectors. So like each, each disc we read in like number of disks sectors at least uh, and, and um, into memory and then Spot it back out again, all all as one chunk, um, and uh, so we have enough memory to do that, which is great because because it's just a little bit of of space. Um, but uh, if you if you die in the in the middle of it, like if the system crashes and some of those writes have ta have been persisted and some haven't, then you'd end up with like the beginning of the disks scrambled up. Um, so we take advantage of this bootloader region, which was previously unused. It's at kind of at the beginning of each disk before. The, um, the allocatable space that I'm depicting here. Um, so we can stick it all there, uh, wait for that to be persisted, then write it to the like real allocatable space region here. Um, and if you crash in the middle, then uh, we can get the data from the bootloader region. It was not actually used for the bootloader, that's just what it was called. Cool, so here's... Uh, <clears throat> Walking through an example of like, we've done that initial um, uh, five squared uh, amount of rewrites, and now we have a separation of six, which means that we can copy one at a time because it's one more than the width. So uh, twenty-one is not used. We need the previous. We need the next ones in case uh, we have a failure, and so we're copying one sector at a time. We get to the end of that first row, and now we have two. Um, sectors in a row that we don't need, so we can copy two at a time, um, and so on and so forth. Each row get it, letting us do one more sector at a time. Um, in reality, the um, bootloader region is large enough that you're gonna be copying like a whole bunch, and so the initial separation is much more than just um, six, you know, it's, it's, a, it's big. And so uh, that improves efficiency a little bit at the, um, at the beginning. So um, design implications. This works with, um, you know, I showed the example of RAID Z1 um, and RAID Z2 works with all the RAID Z1, 2, and 3. You can expand, you can add disks one at a time, uh, multiple times. So you can go from uh, like four wide to five wide, five wide to six wide. 
Um, we talked about the data to parity ratio. You know, this means that um, you know when you go uh, say from four wide to five wide, you'll use about 20% less space for new writes. Um, and uh, we preserve the uh, RAID-Z's redundancy guarantees, um, but the RAID-Z has to be healthy during, like while we're actually copying blocks. So um, if, if we have the disk failure, like we saw in the example, um, RAID-Z is basically gonna, like the expansion is going to pause and wait for the uh, that missing device to be reconstructed. Um, it automatically detects that, you know, based on the IO failures, and uh, that's that's quite tricky to do because we have a bunch of um, reads and writes in flight, uh, and we have to realize, like, oh, you know, we have to figure out how far we actually got stuff persisted, um, and then redo those, uh, reissue, you know, some of those in thing, some of those IOs that might have been in flight to the missing disk um, when it comes back and is re uh, has been reconstructed. Cool. So um, performance, how does it perform? Um, uh, all right, so in this example, uh, we're looking at like logical megabytes per second. So in other words, like the application is writing to a file uh, or a bunch of files, how many megabytes per second can it get? So in this example, uh, before expansion, uh, we're getting 1800 megabytes per second and uh, writes and reads are faster, 2600 megabytes per second because you know, the writes have to write the parity, but the reads don't have to read the parity. Um, after expansion, uh, writes get faster because we're writing less parity per uh, unit of data. Reads um, get slower. And the reason for that is that um, even though we don't technically have to read the parity, um, it, uh, we do read the parity. The reason is that, uh, I should put another slide in there. The reason is that, um, so if you look at this example, previously the parity was all on one disk. So we could just read from these three disks and not that one disk and thus saving some um, you know, bandwidth and IOPS of that disk to be used for other concurrent reads that are happening at the same time. Um, after the expansion, the parity now is kind of going diagonally across the disks. So you see the ones that have the P on them are going diagonally across the disks. So uh, one um, one logical block would typically encompass many um, rows of parity, uh, you know, parity rows. So like this this whole thing might be one logical block, um, and so you have to read all of this. Uh, there isn't like one disk that we can just ignore and not read from. You're gonna have to hit all the disks, and so um, in order to avoid, in order to get good like aggregation, we just read the parity anyways because it performs better that way. Uh, but still not as good as skipping it. Let me go back here. All right, cool. So that's why um, uh, after the expansion, the reads get a little bit slower. I um, mean, this this is this is kind of a worst case example. Um, we're using a shift nine, five twelve byte sector sizes, and we're going from three to four wide raid Z one um, with a larger uh, with wider raid Z um, initial raid Zs. Um, the differences here would be less. Both, you know, the the difference between the read and write would be less, and the like improvement of write and um, decrease in read performance post expansion. All that stuff would be the effects would be less. Um, didn't quite mention this expansion performance yet. Uh, so I talked about how like you know theory expand when we're doing the expansion we're we're reading th everything is going sequentially. Um, it should be really nice for spinning disks or any kind of disks. Um, but in, in practice, the expansion goes really slowly. And uh, the reason for that is that we're, um, we're issuing the ZIOs uh, one sector at a time, so five 12 bytes at a time in this example. Um, and that just has huge CPU costs. Those, those, those ZIOs are all kind of contiguous, so they can be aggregated by the VWQ layer, but the CPU costs of doing that are, are very substantial. Um, this will be less, like if you're using Eight, uh, 4K sector drives, then it'll go 8x faster because um, you just have that many less ZIOs to be processing. Um, so this is an area of uh, future work. Um, and uh, e but even with how it is, um, you know, six terabytes, six hours per terabyte, it's like, yeah, you kick it off, you come back the next day or over the weekend and it's done. It's usable. All right. So, um, where are we at? 
Uh, this is all implemented. Um, we've added tests to uh, the ZTest and the ZFS test suite. Um, I, I opened the final real uh, pull request yesterday. Um, so it's ready for code review. There's still a few things that um, I need to do, uh, some code cleanup, um, investing a few last uh, test failures. There's a bunch of um, future work that, uh, that um, I may or may not have time to do, but uh, we would love other folks help on as well. Um, the performance of the reflow, um, there's, uh, you know, it's very straightforward how we would improve that by issuing, um, you know, just issuing, uh, basically doing the aggregation in the uh, RAID-Z layer, which is what we're doing for reads that happen post, uh, post expansion. Um, so that you don't, so that you aren't dealing with all these millions of, uh, of little ZIOs. Um, other ideas like um, adding multiple drives at a time, um, like maybe you have a six wide and you want to add two drives. You can do that today by adding one and then adding the second one. Um, but there, you're like copying all the data twice. Uh, it would be nice if you could just say, "I want to add both of these," and have it copy all the data just once. Um, it would also be nice to rewrite the existing data with the new data to parity ratio, saving you some space. Um, I worked. I worked with the DRAID authors, um, Mark and Brian, uh, on kind of how we would do a similar style of expansion with DRAID, um, and I think that that would work uh, pretty well. Um, not implemented yet. Uh, and uh, lastly, for kind of extra extra safety, maybe having an option to kick off scrubs uh, before and or after the um, the expansion completes. Um, I've got, uh, so uh, this is the quadrennial report. I've been working on this for about four years. Uh, we've got a lot of questions about what this does and doesn't do over the years. Um, there's a lot of things that are kind of related to moving space around um, that is not, uh, that this design doesn't, um, uh, you know, implement. So like um, adding additional parity or removing disks or defragmenting. And as we saw, it's like, we're moving everything into like the calculated new places. We aren't. Uh, moving things, uh, moving these around logically. Um, so I'd like to give a big thank you to the FreeBSD Foundation for sponsoring this work and um, for sticking with me for uh, the past four years. For, uh, the the original uh, time estimate for how long it would take me to find all the time to do, to do this was not four years. <laughs> um, and uh, thanks to my employer, Delphix, for um, allowing me to do this. Um, and a couple of other contributors who have done uh, significant work on this, uh, Fedor from VStack and, and Stuart, uh, whose work was also sponsored by the foundation. Um, we'll take questions in just a sec. Um, if you like what you learned about ZFS, uh, you can get involved. Um, FreeBSD's free ZFS is uh, the shared code base with uh, Linux and FreeBSD uh, since FreeBSD 13. Um, we do our development on GitHub. Uh, so you can see this pull request and all the open pull requests there. Uh, we have monthly um, open ZFS meetings, so just Zoom calls. The next one's uh, June 22nd. And we have an annual conference, um, which is normally in person. It was uh, online last year. We're still trying to figure out what exactly we're doing this year, but it'll be um, in, the, in the fall. And you can find all the info and links to this stuff on our website, openzfs.org. Awesome. Uh, now, uh, hopefully, I have a minute or two for questions. Yeah, you, you can. Take a couple of minutes. OK, cool. Uh, first question, I think I answered, are new rates still allocated with the old data parity ratio? No, they're allocated with the new one. Um, does RAID-Z expansion break booting from a pool with un on unformatted disk with the bootloader DD to the bootloader region? Uh, I was not aware of that use case. Um, breaks the systems booting from a pool. It, hmm. Yeah, I, I was not aware of that use case. Uh, I, I assume by unformatted, you mean it doesn't have a GPT label, um, but it is part of a pool. Uh, I would like to learn more about that, uh, Jan. Um, if you wouldn't mind getting in touch with me, um, either on the uh, OpenZFS PR or, um, uh, or email me, uh, mearens at uh, delphix.com or matt at delphix.com, um, then I'd like to figure out uh, how that use case works. Um, next question. 
Is it faster to recreate the pool if enough temp disks are available? Uh, a, because, uh, well, I mean, depends on what you, yeah. I assume what you're talking about is like, could I, should I just copy the data off of that RAID Z onto a new pool, reconfigure the um, pool, you know, create then destroy that original pool, recreate it with the wider, uh, with, you know, with a wider RAID Z, and then copy everything back. Uh, I mean, you can certainly do that, and like that works today. That's worked, you know, for the past decade. Um, is it faster? Uh, well, <laughs> because the um, exp expansion performance is so abysmal right now. Yeah, it probably would be faster. I mean, assuming that you have all, of course, you got to have all that hardware lying around. Um, it, but uh, it is not theoretically faster. So um, uh, if we address these, you know, performance, you know, we can do this kind of local optimization of um, how the expansion is processing the ZIOs, and then um, the expansion would be faster. But yeah, I mean, if you've, if you've got all the hardware lying around, then just yeah, sure. Do, do your expansion with like ZFS send dash R to a new pool and then ZFS send dash R back to another new pool. All right. Those are all the questions that I saw in the Q&A. Are there other ones? There was one question on IRC that I think you may have answered, but I'll ask you anyway, which was, does not in the current work, but does this pave the way perhaps for allowing, I think they asked RAID Z2 to RAID Z3 conversions in the future? No, it does not. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, it, as you kind of saw, hopefully, um, the like how it works should should make it clear why that is. You know, we're not actually looking at. Um, we don't know where the parity is. We don't care where the parity is um, as part of the expansion. So we aren't like changing the we aren't changing the data. We're just, or the parity. We're just moving it around. Uh, there's a question about does the if the original bootloader region um, doesn't produce a desirable separation, do you use it again until it does? Um, we don't have to do that because it's so big. Um, the math works out that um, if you're using RAID Z, if you, sorry, if you're using um, 4K sectors or smaller, then uh, the boot region is large enough for RAID Zs that are like 700 wide or less. Um, and uh, you can only have a, a rate, you only have it up to 255 wide. Um, that's the maximum possible. So uh, with RAID Z, like, you know, ever. Um, so uh, I think that means that, you know, you can have uh, your sector size can be up to like 32K and the bootloader region will be large enough. Um, if, uh, if that, if someday you're like, oh, actually my sector size is like 128K or something, then yeah, you might, then, um, we might have to implement kind of what you're implying there, um, Jeremy, which is to, uh, do this, like, um, shuffling through the bootloader region multiple times. Um, but that's not implemented today because it's, it's, it's not, it's definitely not needed. And in fact, because the, the bootloader region is so much bigger, um, it, it means that you know once you've done that, then you're never at this like one sector at a time separation because uh, which is nice because that set, the amount of separation there tells you like once you reach the end of it, you have to do a txg sync to persist that so that like you know if you crash, then you know where the progress is, so you know where to read um, any blocks from old versus new locations. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions. I do, someone on IRC did say that I guess the use case where FreeBSD uses the boot area is for booting ZFS with an MBR instead of GPT. So I don't know. Most people are using GPT. You could always say maybe you just can't expand those pools or something. But yeah, but I would love to be able to detect that. Um, you know, like it, it, it would not be great to just splat over it in that use case. Um, yeah. I'd rather I'd rather detect it and be able to say like oh no you can't you can't do expansion because x y and z you know switch to GPT partitions or whatever. Right. Um, so yeah. so I'd love to figure out like how how do we detect that? Yeah, Thanks. Definitely. <clears throat>
OK. Uh, so thanks, Matt. We're going to take about a five minute break. And then we come back. Let me see if we double check that schedule. Our next talk is actually going to be Mark Johnston talking about development workflows um, that he uses when working on FreeBSD stuff. So thanks again, Matt. And we'll take about a five minute break. See you all in a bit.
Hi, hi, hi. I was busy over in the uh, hallway track. I didn't hear the alarm go off. Sorry. Um, so, uh, which is a reminder, folks, y'all can come hang out and chat with us over in the hallway track during our breaks. Uh, but next, we're going to have Mark Johnston talking about uh, development workflows and some of the processes he uses while working on FreeBSD. So I'll turn it over to Mark. Hello. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let me just share my screen. So let's see if that works properly. Yep. Oh, I need to resize it a little bit. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Uh, so, hello, I'm Mark Johnston. Um, I work for the FreeBSD Foundation. I've been a FreeBSD source committer for, um, I think, about eight or nine years now, um, working in uh, a bunch of different areas. I do a lot of work on the kernel. Um, and uh, for the past few years, I've been working uh, more or less as, as an independent contributor to, to FreeBSD in the sense that uh, while I work for the FreeBSD Foundation, most of the infrastructure that I use to actually do my daily work uh, as far as Code reviews, building, testing, and so on goes. Um, I use my own. I use my own systems. Um, so while preparing for this talk, I basically spent a bunch of time trying to clean up the number of scripts that I use to automate various parts of that workflow. Um, and uh, the, the problems I want to talk about, which which motivates some of the things I'm going to share, are basically that it, I get the impression that a lot of FreeBSD developers. Um, either belong to an organization where that kind of infrastructure is handled, like there's some infrastructure team that has a CI pipeline that you can use, um, or uh, folks have their own sets of scripts for, for automating various things. Um, we, we don't have a lot of shared infrastructure for doing things like uh, building a VM image that you can use to run the, uh, the, the FreeBSD test suite. Um, it's, it's certainly not that difficult, but uh, for someone new to FreeBSD, new as a contributor, for instance, a GSOC student or a co-op student, um, we, we don't have any canned ways of doing that really. Um, so what I want to show you is some, uh, uh, ra rather than trying to uh, make my own scripts production worthy, because I think that's actually fairly difficult to do in a, in a useful way, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I wanted to show, uh, show off some experiments I've been doing using a Bastille BSD, which is a, a GL manager. Um, so, uh, going back to that example of, of just running the, the FreeBSD test suite, um, we can consider the example where I have a uh, uh, single change to the kernel. So, a simple patch. And basically, the problem I want to solve is okay, well, I want to run the test suite with this kernel modification applied. I want to do that as quickly as possible, ideally with a single command. Um, how can I do that? Uh, so the, the basic steps generally involve, so if, I mean, there, there's lots of ways you can go about this. You could just compile the kernel on a, on a spare system, reboot into it and run the test suite. Uh, for my purposes, I don't have a huge amount of hardware lying around. Uh, so I try to use uh, virtual machines and, and in particular Beehive as much as possible because that makes things uh, a lot easier. Um, so already I have a few steps ahead of me. I have to build a new kernel, install it into a VM image, boot the VM image somehow, run the test suite, collect the results. Um, so there's, there's a few steps and, and we have single commands which can do most of those things, right? We, we have uh, high level build targets. You can make the whole FreeBSD world. You can make the kernel. You can install it to a directory. You can create a file system from the contents of a directory. You can create a disk image. Uh, populated with partitions uh, uh, that uh, consist of the file systems that you just created. But that's a whole bunch of steps. And like I said, um, I, I have the distinct impression that we, we really don't have a good uh, shared set of tools that if not everyone, then, then most people can use in an accessible way. Um, there are tools that help with certain subsets of these tasks. So for instance, Pudriere image is quite useful. Um, you can use it to uh, create a jail based on a, on a Git tree and with a single command build the VM image. But then you're left with the problems of, oh, well, how do I boot it? How do I configure it to run the test suite automatically? And actually, Pudriere makes that uh, fairly straightforward as well, but it's, it's really not as simple as I'd like. 
Um, so while I spent a bunch of time trying to write scripts to, to automate a lot of this stuff, I kept running into problems wherein, um, you know, I, I ended up having to make assumptions about my own environment. I would hard code paths. I would have to have some directory to store a state. Um, I try to make use of jails, VNet, and ZFS as much as possible because they make it really easy to create ephemeral um, FreeBSD instances in the sense that I can uh, create something that I can later throw away, which is exactly what I want for, for a one-off task like running the, uh, the FreeBSD test suite on a particular change. Once the test suite is run and everything's passed, I probably don't want to keep that VM image around. Um, so trying to solve this with my own scripts is, is a bit daunting because I end up having to re-implement a bunch of things that, that other um, fairly popular FreeBSD software already does. So like I said, I, I use jails and VNet a lot. We have quite a few jail managers. Um, I, I, uh, Pudra is quite capable uh, uh, when it comes to building images. We also have uh, uh, release targets in the source tree. Um, the, the Jenkins CI infrastructure that we use has its own set of scripts for building VM images. So all of the, all of the components kind of exist somewhere, but in, in a monolithic, um, sort of monolithic uh, uh, piece of software. Like if I want to tweak something about the way Poudrier builds images, um, I might end up having to look at the source code and modify it, which is not really something I want to have to do. Um, so, my goal, again, is to, to try and make it easier to share tooling and to try and make it easier for new contributors uh, to, to get started with a bit less friction. Um, my goal is generally to try and automate basic things with a single command as much as possible and to use all these nice FreeBSD features, again, JLS, Beehive, VNet, ZFS, and so on, um, as much as possible. Um, as far as actual development goes, I also want to be able to use Beehive to uh, have short edit compile test loops um, to, to the extent that's possible with kernel development. I mean, anytime you modify the kernel, you have to reboot. But if you do that in, in a VM and you make it possible to, to install a new kernel into a VM quickly, then you can actually uh, uh, get a pretty tight loop um, in the order of 20 or 30 seconds or so. So um, as you might have noticed, I don't have any slides uh, where I actually uh, uh, kind of go through most of these steps. I wanted to instead uh, show a couple of short demos, making use of Bastille to implement um, uh, solutions to some of these tasks in a, in a modular way that separates concerns. The problem with writing monolithic scripts is that you end up adding a whole bunch of options to control various configuration parameters. So again, I have this kernel change I want to test. Okay, well, uh, I can build a generic kernel or I can build a generic a uh, KA SAN kernel, if I want to test with a, a kernel address sanitizer enabled, I might want to build it for ARM64, RISC V rather than AMD64. Uh, I might want to use a particular source path for the, uh, for the tree rather than user source. There's basically a whole bunch of configuration options that I, that I might want to choose from. Um, I mean, just going to more examples, I might want to have customized source.comp options so that I build this quick. I might want to install some packages into the VM um, before I boot it. Um, there's, there's quite a few different things. And, and again, writing monolithic uh, scripts to, to automate this works well at the beginning, but once you have enough people using them, uh, you end up with, with all these configuration parameters and, and lots of difficulties around uh, uh, hard-coded assumptions that one has to make. So Bastille, um, I won't talk about Bastille specifically too much. Um, it's, and, and as it happens, uh, the author, uh, Christer, uh, gave a FreeBSD Friday's talk last week uh, about exactly that. Uh, he, he presented Bastille BSD and showed off some of its features with some demos on our, on our Raspberry Pi. Um, it's, it's a jail manager. It's not dissimilar from some of the other ones that are quite popular. Um, I've used IOCage a bit as well. Uh, but there's one feature of Bastille which actually makes it quite appealing to me, and that's templates. Uh, and that's, templates are, uh, uh, as far as I know, a fairly unique feature to, uh, to Bastille. I don't know of any real equivalents in others. I know IOKage has some plugin mechanism, but I haven't looked at it in, in any great depth. Um, but the point is uh, a template allows you to specify some parameterized set of configuration and logic that gets applied to a new channel. 
Um, so what I use them to do is uh, essentially create a jail, nullfs mount my source tree into it, build a VM image, and start the VM. And the structure of Bastille templates means that I can split out the logic of creating, uh, creating and configuring uh, uh, jails from from other components of, of this task. Um, so again, when I want to build a VM image to run the test suite, I have to build the world, build the kernel, create a file system, populate with some, some uh, for, for instance, my VM image probably wants to have an etcf stub. Um, there, there's, there's a whole bunch of different things. So there's a few different steps. And Bastille templates make it fairly straightforward, actually, to inject customized logic into any one of those steps. Um, so I've been working on a, on a set of templates that make it easy to automate uh, some of the things that I used to do with my own monolithic scripts before. And um, so the demos, I hope, will kind of convince you that this is a, a pretty good path forward. Um, and it's, it's something for me that's still a work in progress, but it's, uh, I think, quite promising. And I'm looking forward to uh, experimenting further with it. Um, I've already uh, written a few templates which make it possible to run syscaller in, uh, in um, a jail, which is something I've been trying to automate without a huge amount of success for a long time. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about it, uh, talk a little bit about that later. But uh, for now, I'll just kind of get into uh, the examples I wanted to show. Um, so again, going back to this kernel change that I have on the screen, I want to run tests for that. So um, I enumerated some of the steps that are required before. And I'll kind of show you what that looks like as a Bastille template. So I have a, a, a template called Bastille test VM. Um, it's basically just a small set of files that live in a Git repository. They're on GitHub. Bastille has a nice little feature, which I mean, it's just a wrapper for Git clone, but you can import templates from GitHub and GitLab and so on uh, very, very easily. So it's, a, it's, it's quite convenient um, if you're trying to share templates with others uh, and uh, uh, so on. So there's a Bastille file. In this uh, in this directory, which basically contains all of the logic um, that I want to apply to a jail after it's been created. So the standard workflow is I create a jail based on some release, usually 13.0 in my case. Uh, I bring it up and then I tell Bastille to apply this template. Uh, and so this syntax, I mean, it seems pretty obviously inspired by Docker files. It's not identical, but it's a it's a pretty similar idea. It's a constrained language. Uh, that lets me uh, execute arbitrary commands within a jail, and it has a whole bunch of affordances that let me um, connect the jail to, to resources, resources outside of it. So, for instance, one thing that I, I try to do pretty carefully is not have multiple Git clones of my, uh, of my uh, FreeBSD tree sitting around because they tend to get out of sync and I forget which one I contains which changes and so on. So I try to have a central um, uh, git clone, perhaps with many work trees, and I use nullfs mounts to expose that uh, to uh, to wherever the, the build is actually taking place. So for instance, in this particular case, there's a single mount command, which takes a FreeBSD host source path and mounts it at a source path, source path within, the, within the jail. Um, at the beginning, I've declared a few uh, uh, variables which are used uh, in the rest of the, uh, the Bastille file. Uh, some of them are public in the sense that you can specify that when you apply the template, so obviously you might want to change the, the parallelism of the build depending on how many cores your build system has. You might want to use a particular external tool chain. Obviously you want to be able to specify the, the source path uh, on the host and the kernel configuration. Uh, so those are all things you can do uh, on the command line when you actually apply this. Um, um, Are there any questions so far? Does Bastille support jails with just a handful of executables and their shared libs? Um, I don't quite know what that means. Uh, are, you, are you referring to the distinction between thin and thick jails? Um, and, and if so, yes, it does. Um, the way uh, this particular workflow works um, is that I, I basically bootstrap a, a copy of 13.0 and Bastille creates jails using that using nullfs mounts. 
So all of the jails share a common copy of the base system. It's also possible to, to uh, create so-called thick jails in which uh, uh, the, the jails copy of the base system is, is completely independent from, from anything else. Um, SDL also supports VNet jails, which is what I use pretty much exclusively, uh, just because I find them to be uh, um, easier to configure and, and more flexible. Um, so this is the complete Bastille file uh, that I used to build uh, a VM image from a particular source path that will, uh, and then when the VM image, when the VM is booted, it will automatically run the test suite, uh, print a report and then shut down. So that's as, that's, as, as you'll see, it's not quite one command, but it's uh, a lot simpler than, uh, uh, what I've used in the past, in the sense that you know, there's 50 files in this. You know, a third of them just declare variables. Most of them are pretty bog standard. I'm, I'm building a world, built a kernel, install world, install kernel, and so on. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's very straightforward. And basically, what I, what I like about it, particularly, is that it lets me separate concerns. Um, I can use Bastille to, with a single command, create a jail uh, with its own network stack with its own ZFS data set. And uh, that's totally independent from this template that I applied onto it. Uh, so there's a few other files in the, uh, in the template and those are effectively an overlay. Uh, so these are things that get copied into the jail when the template is applied. So I have a script called run.sh, which does nothing but run beehive uh, with, uh, with, the, with the VM image that uh, uh, was created by the Bastille file. So, Another useful uh, uh, little feature that uh, Bastille templates implement is that you can uh, specify a variable once and then uh, tell it to substitute that variable in any uh, overlay files. So you don't end up having to uh, duplicate various configuration variables. So, I mean, I won't try to explain what's happening here too much. Um, oh, there, there, there's one other little, Little thing. So in VMNC, these are overlay files that get copied into the uh, into the VM image. Uh, I just use RC local to actually run the test script. So it does nothing but run QA and write a report and shut down. So in a, in a more sophisticated infrastructure, you'd probably want something that can actually, you know, uh, send mail or, or post to some Slack channel or something like that. Um, but I think again, the fact that it's possible to uh, uh, split up all this logic in, in, a, in a composable way um, makes it a lot easier to implement that sort of thing. These, these templates that I'm gonna show are, are very much works in progress that I'm still uh, using to replace my existing scripts. Is there another question? Does the virtualization influence the resulting behavior of properties to build systems? I mean, something depending on timing, for example. Um, for, it, for some specific cases, yes, um, there, there are certain things that VMs are not convenient for. Um, so this isn't really a universal solution to the problem of how do I, how do I you know, run the test suite and make sure that I have not introduced any bugs. I mean, for one, our test suite definitely won't catch everything. It, it's been growing um, quite steadily over the past few years and it, it catches bugs very regularly, um, but it's, it's not perfect. And there's definitely, uh, there's definitely cases where it's not going to be sufficient. You're going to have to go back to the old school way of just, you know, install um, a kernel on a, on a system, reboot it. For instance, whenever I work on, um, or not not whenever, but sometimes when I work on uh, changes to the memory management code in the in the kernel, um, I'm making use of some particular properties of the hardware platform. Uh, Numa is a big one. I have a, I have a two socket system here that I use for a lot of uh, a lot of my sort of beefier testing. Um, but for a lot of purposes, uh, the running, running the, the test suite in a VM is, is a perfectly good way to catch a lot of problems. That's exactly what our CI system does. Um, and it's, you know, again, the point isn't to, to try and catch everything before it gets pushed into main. The point is to, to raise the baseline and make it easier for contributors to feel confident about their changes without having to um, interact or without having to get feedback from a human because feedback from humans is bad, but um, it's, it's nice to 
have have some level of assurance before uh, before you start involving other people. So, so that's the the test VM template which I created, which again does nothing but uh, create a test VM and provide a script to run it. So, um, I can I I have a few uh, uh, Bastille jails already created. Um, you can see there's one called test VM which already has uh, this template applied. So I'll just show very quickly what that looks like. Uh, when, I, when, I run a, when I want to run, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the test suite, it's basically a, a single command. That's it, or at least it should be. So there we go, Beehive is now running in the foreground. I'm gonna boot up. This takes a few seconds, but it's you know, reasonably quick. And right away, it just starts running the test suite. And uh, once it's done, it'll shut itself down automatically. I just told it there. This takes, takes a little while to run, but uh, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll show uh, another example where I actually apply that to, uh, to a new jail. And um, again, haven't quite cut this down to a single command that I can just run. But I'm I'm pretty close, and it shouldn't be too hard to write a few wrapper scripts to do that. Uh, so the reason I'm excited about this stuff again is is the the ability to split apart different things. Um, <clears throat> if you ever look at the uh, the the CI scripts we use in Jenkins, um, there's quite a lot of build scripts in there um, for for various targets. Um, there's a lot of duplication that happens, and I, I don't think that's that's I, I think that's just Kind of the, the the nature of the way uh, this this particular piece of infrastructure works. It's kind of monolithic. It's not really easy to take the scripts right out of our, our FreeBSD CI um, environment and just kind of drop them somewhere locally and have them just work automatically. Um, so here, though, you know the, the the basic basic requirements are pretty minimal. You have to have Bastille installed, which is you know a package install, and, and you enable it in rc.conf. And if you want it to use ZFS you tell it which C pool to use. Uh, so what I'd kind of like us to, to, to move towards, at least as far as the, you know, CI infrastructure goes, um, is exactly that kind of separation where we maintain a set of uh, you know, templates. I mean, I, Bastille I like because it, it already has all these things implemented. It, it's definitely not perfect, and I'll talk a little bit about that depending on how much time I have. Um, but uh, it's, I, th I think this, this kind of forced separation is, is definitely the right way to go. I think it will make it a lot easier for organizations that consume FreeBSD to set up their own CI pipelines um, without having to kind of uh, rebuild everything from scratch, which is really what I suspect uh, more or less happens today. So as far as actually creating um, a new, new jail, so I'll create a new one called SVM2. Um, the, the dash V just means it's a VNet jail. Uh, this is the base release. I want it to use DHCP. Um, so it's going to uh, it's going to do that automatically. It takes a few seconds, but it's it's reasonably quick. And now I have one. Of course, it shows up now when I uh, run Bastille list. And it's you know, Bastille stores a bunch of state, of course. It has a jail.com, um, a few other pieces of configuration. But it's, it's really quite simple. There's an FS tab, there's a jail.com, and there's the actual uh, root directory of the jail. So if I want to tweak, uh, you know, any, any settings in here, which I tend to do, and I think this is actually one of Bastille's, uh, uh, maybe not weaknesses, but it's, it's an area where I think it could use a bit more, uh, uh, a bit better UI. Um, it's, uh, you know, really, really quite straightforward and, and intuitive to configure. Bastille itself is, is really simple. It's written in shell script. It's, it's easy to read. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, there's a question, um, can templates be nested? Uh, yes. Yeah. I actually didn't mention that. I haven't really made use of it yet, but it's possible for templates to include other templates. Um, so in that way, um, I think it'll be possible to build uh, uh, some infrastructure that makes it easy for me to kind of compose um, workflows based on uh, uh, 
basically reusing existing components. So here I gave an example where we run the FreeBSD regression test suite. There's other test suites. Uh, Peter Holmes Stress 2 is a really good example. Um, I occasionally run that in VMs. Uh, it, it should be very straightforward for me to reuse the logic uh, I, I put in this test VM template um, to create a VM in which I can run Stress 2 instead of the regression test suite. Uh, so uh, that, that, that's one of the things I, I plan to do in the, in the coming few days. Uh, so there's, there's again, uh, I think a lot of composability here. And another question is, how does Bastille compare to uh, POT? Um, I'm actually not too familiar with POT. I've, I've played around with it a little bit. Um, as I understand it, uh, POT schools are, are really about orchestration and making it easier for, uh, making it easier for, um, uh, uh, to, to run a jail using uh, uh, various orchestration tools. Um, uh, so I, I, think th I think their goals are, are a bit different. I, I, it's hard for me to really say anything intelligent. Um, uh, but uh, um, I, I mean, again, Bastille itself is not, and I, you know, I, I don't want to comment too much on the merits of, of various jail managers, but um, Bastille templates are really the, the kind of killer feature for me. Um, I think a lot of the standard jail managers all provide pretty similar functionality. Um, and, and but this is this is one area where it seems to be uh, uh, a bit different. So, you know, I, I don't think Bastille itself is necessarily the end all be all, but I think it definitely provides a, 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 a direction forward and, and um, uh, some some really nice ideas that uh, that can be uh, that can be used here. We've talked a lot over the past few months about um, having pre pre commit CI testing uh, done more more rigorously. And, and other things like that. Um, there's, there's a lot of conversations to be had about how exactly we go about that. Um, but I think this provides a, 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 few of the, a few of the missing pieces, or at least it can. Uh, how do I get test results? Um, so going back to my RC local script, um, you can see there's a line that says Q or report. So right now it only prints, um, it prints the results to standard output basically. Bastille automatically collects the console log somewhere. So it's, it's pretty trivial to just fetch that and, and uh, look at it. Uh, I, I would, once I've had some more time to hack on these templates, I'll probably um, have some way of actually exporting the file, the, the QA report file back to the, to the jail in which the VM is running. And then, um, you know, by default print that somewhere or, or add it to an email and so on. Uh, another question, uh, I don't think I have a ton of time left, so I should probably um, not try to answer too much more, but uh, how two, does... more two more minutes? Oh, yeah. okay. Okay, it might be a bit more. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll try to be very quick. Um, but the, the question is, how does network performance of VNet and on FreeBSD 13? Um, I don't think it's great. I, I did some profiling of it last year, but I, I haven't really identified some of the problems, um, or I, I haven't root caused any of the problems or, or done much to, to actually fix them. Um, uh, all, the, all the packets through an ePair kind of get bounced to a NetISR thread. Um, and that slows things down quite a lot. There's a lot of context switching. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not great, but I think it's, it's something that, uh, that will be improved as, as time goes on. Okay, so very quickly, I'm gonna, oh, I already created my VM. Um, so one, uh, one catch, uh, is that with jails, I have to uh, explicitly say that I want to allow um, you have to be used. So that's that's basically a jail.conf variable. Like that. And now I apply the template that I just showed you to this new jail. Uh, so I won't, I mean, this, this takes a little while to, to run because it builds, uh, builds all the FreeBSD, installs a few packages. I installed toolchain packages to reduce the build times. Um, but uh, once, once it's done, you have a jail in which you can run the test suite very easily. And I specify additional parameters. Like this. So if I want to, if I want to make use of all the cores on the system to, to build, then this is one of the few uh, parameters that I can specify. Uh, 
the Elegant package, but it doesn't respond to control C. Okay. Uh, so that was the test VM. I have a similar um, a similar template that I use to uh, do kind of compile it at test loops. Uh, so again, this this template has already been applied uh, to uh, a jail called dev. So this one just drops in a login prompt, and uh, I have another another script that lives in the uh, uh, the template, which lets me rebuild the kernel. So you can see I have a few different parameters. Um, they're chosen by default to try and minimize the rebuild time. Uh, so what I do here is I actually install a kernel into a separate disk, and I have the VM configured to boot off of that disk. So that way. Every time I want to install a new kernel from the host into the VM, um, instead of rebuilding a whole VM image, I can just uh, uh, I can just create a new kernel disk, and I don't have to mount any file systems or anything like that. It's it's pretty fast. So this will do an incremental rebuild by default. Um, it's still a bit pokey, and I'm actually not quite sure why. Um, for instance, I've noticed that uh, the incremental uh, Uh, yeah, you can see it's linking the kernel, and it'll do this each time. But uh, yeah, I found that it's annoying for me too. For some reason, it decides it always needs to rebuild verge that verge that c, even though yeah. I feel like it shouldn't. And so there's like one dependency, and so every time I do something in a module, it yeah. always rebuilds the kernel. It's annoying as it is. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, here, here we have. Here we have uh, uh, oh, sorry, I think feedback on the mic here, John. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll try to wrap this up uh, very quickly. Um, it's all right, don't worry. <laughs> I have uh, one more example, which is a bit more involved, but I, I won't go into it in too much detail. So you can see I, I rebuilt the kernel in 27 seconds. That was actually pretty slow. A lot of that comes from linking running CTF merge. I'm going to try and fix that once I get a chance. And then it installs the kernel, rebuilds. And so now in the VM, if I shut down, or if I reboot rather, um, it'll automatically reboot into the, the new kernel that I installed. So I have a pretty at least from a kernel developer's perspective, a fairly tight um, at a compiled test loop. So I, I think that's that's pretty useful. And the last template I want to show is a lot more involved, but uh, um, something I personally found uh, pretty, pretty handy is uh, a template that lets me run a syscaller in, uh, in a FreeBSD jail. So uh, Syscaller is a project from from Google, which is, it, it's it's basically an operating system fuzzer. Um, it effectively generates random programs and then runs them, and, and with the end goal of trying to crash your kernel. Uh, it's very good at that, uh, and it uses VMs to do that because uh, you know that gives you a, a sealed environment that you can where, where you can where you can run whatever programs you want, and you don't have to worry about destroying any state uh, in the fuzzer itself. So I have. Uh, Steel file for this. It's somewhat more involved than um, the rest, but it's actually still pretty simple. Um, so, because syscaller wants to create a bunch of VMs, um, you know, it, th there's a few there's a few pieces of configuration. Um, I create um, a bridge interface in the in the in the jails VNet. Um, I uh, enable DNS masks so it can hand out uh, IPs to the to the fuzzer VMs. I create an SSH key so that syscaller can log into the VMs and copy files to and from. Um, and uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of configuration. And I think a lot of people have not really set up syscaller on FreeBSD, partly because currently you have to do a whole bunch of manual configuration. Uh, but with Bastille, a lot of that goes away. There's still some a bit of manual configuration that you need, and that's documented in README. Um, but uh, uh, I think probably 90% of it goes away if you just apply this template. And I can show you very quickly what that looks like. And I think that'll, that'll probably wrap it up for me, unfortunately. Um, so I have a, so I want to, I have a, I have an RC script which starts this caller. Um, this manager. Oh, 
And at, if you uh, run it, you can see Sys Manager starting. It's automatically starting VMs. It starts a web server as well. You can, uh, I'm not sharing my browser, but I'll, I'll show you here. Um, you can kind of see uh, in a real browser, it looks, it looks a lot better, uh, but it, it's, it's got a bunch of state, a bunch of counters for, for things that it's doing. Nothing yet, just because I, I only just started it, but uh, um, uh, you get things like crash reports and reproducers here. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy that I was able to uh, uh, create a template, which lets me install all this stuff with, with relative ease. I think it took me maybe like three or four hours and it was my first, it was the, my first time trying to use Bastille templates. So um, I guess to, to summarize everything I've said so far, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this, uh, 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 this kind of approach to building, to building tooling that I can, I can share with other developers. And it's something uh, I, I expect to spend a, a fair bit more time on um, going forward. Um, there, there are some UI issues, especially around jails that make a few things cumbersome, but I think this is a good incentive to actually uh, uh, try and go in and, and fix some of those. Um, I'd, ha I'd be happy to talk about what they are, but I, I think I've definitely run, run, uh, run out of time. Um, but uh, if, if you're interested, uh, please feel free to, to reach out to me. And I'll also probably start a few mailing list threads about some of the, the more egregious issues that uh, I run into. Um, thanks. Sure. Do you have your uh, scripts pushed to like a private repository or public repository on GitHub or something like that? Yeah, they, they are. Um, so, so I develop them on my workstation and then I use, uh, I, I don't have links for them available, but uh, um, they're right there. I'll, I'll post, I'll create a link on the Dev Summit page uh, to, to another wiki page, which has these links. Again, they're, they're very much works in progress. I'm not quite ready to actually have anyone else use them yet, um, but uh, I, well, I think they're- in, in my experience, like my GD, my KGDB scripts are also works in progress, but people still use them because I yeah. pushed them somewhere, so. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I mean, it's, you know, if, if you want to go ahead and, and grab one of these, it's really just a matter of running this uh, bootstrap command on your own system. Uh, if you run that, you'll get this template stored locally, and then you can reference it um, in, in the sense that you can create your own jails and start applying it. Cool. Okay. Well, why don't we, uh, well, thank you, Mark. That was very cool. There's a lot of good feedback and stuff on IRC. Um, let's take about a 10 minute break. Uh, and then after our 10 minute break, we're gonna come back for our next session. Our next session is gonna be a panel focused on downstream distros that are kind of desktop focused, which is gonna be chaired by Ed. So I'll see everyone in about 10 minutes. Thanks again, Mark. Um, does my mic work? Just to test. Yes, for me. my work is, is working. And by the way, I, I, Ed reminded me, I'm going to go hang out in the hallway tracks. So Y'all are welcome to come hang out in there during your break if you're not doing something else. And we'll see you in about nine minutes or so.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Next up, we have our, our desktop and distro panel, which is going to be chaired by Ed. And then Ed has a various folks. I'm going to turn over to Ed and let Ed introduce the various folks on our panel and take it from here. All right, thanks, John. So this is a, a panel discussion uh, focused on downstream uh, projects and in particular um, desktop focused and user focused uh, downstreams, um, what we might call a, a distro um, uh, perhaps. Uh, and so we've, we have uh, Eric from GhostBSD, Simon from Hello System, uh, the two projects, uh, two projects that are built on FreeBSD and are focused on the end user desktop environment. Um, and then we've got uh, Manu and uh, Charlie from uh, the FreeBSD graphics team, uh, hopefully. So if we have some questions and discussion that happens, uh, we can figure out what we need to do and um, uh, where we need to go. So my, uh, my goal here is to kind of figure out what um, challenges and uh, what FreeBSD does well and what FreeBSD can do to improve the experience um, of our downstream desktop focused community. Uh, and it's gonna be a fairly interactive and um, open session. So if there's questions and uh, discussion throughout, um, you know, please uh, use the Q and A in, um, in Zoom and we'll, we'll keep an eye on IRC and YouTube as well as we go. So um, I'll start off, uh, why don't we start off with uh, Eric um, and if you can just give me a, a brief introduction about um, your, your distro and sort of what the key features uh, are, who's your um, sort of prototypical uh, user. Okay. Um, yeah, because well, because this is basically uh iOS based on FreePSC that is for basically desktop and laptop. Uh, we focus have to have uh, everything ready for the user um, uh, to use right away when it, it is installed. Uh, the install process is on a live uh, on a live um, session on a desktop. Um, Key features is basically like we try to we try to have um, everything like package managing from UI. Um, same things for network um, managing. Mostly right now it's mostly like um, only Wi-Fi connection, but later we're gonna add like um, network, like uh, static and the the ability to change option like uh, static and everything in the UI. Um, it's mostly like we try to make the tool to make it more uh, goes busy, more usable for someone that only knows UI. It's basically what we focus on. That's basically our key uh, feature. Uh, or mostly our our user are people that are afraid to uh, run a terminal. <laughs> it's a uh, oh, there's a lot of user that's still good with the terminal, but a um, bunch of users. Um, that's what we have for now. Okay, uh, and Simon, uh, same question for you. What um, give me a little bit of a introduction to Hello System? Um, and uh, sort of who are you, uh, who are you targeting with, uh, with the work you're doing? See, we, uh, we don't hear your audio, uh, Simon. Send a note in the chat.
Okay, we'll um, figure out, uh, we'll try to figure out what's uh, going on with the technical difficulties uh, we're having, but um, uh, I'll uh, go through the, um, the two uh, uh, panelists from the FreeBSD graphics team. Um, so Manu, do you want to uh, uh, introduce yourself briefly and um, let us know what sorts of um, uh, areas of focus, uh, what, what, what areas of the graphics stack you've uh, focused on and, and what you, uh, your background is? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? If someone can tell me if uh, sound is going. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I, I have some delay on the video, so that's, yeah. So it's working now. Yeah, it's working now. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, so my name is Manu. Uh, my area of interest in FreeBSD is very, very large. Uh, and on the graphics side, uh, it's anything graphics related. Uh, so that's uh, kernel driver, um, uh, user on stacks or uh, Mesa, Xorg, Wayland, etc. And anything that can make uh, well something like I just had uh, does not happen. For example, I was on way on just before and I needed to start at XORG to join this meeting. Uh, so yeah, I was unaware of this issue. Uh, and yeah, this is something that I will look at it. So yeah, I like to work on everything that make everyone happy. <laughs> All right, thanks. And uh, Charlie? Okay, so I'm Charlie. Uh, that's my uh, FreeBSD uh, username here. I'm actually part of the desktop team and um, and also the GNOME team, which kind of falls under the desktop umbrella, so to speak. And um, yeah, I just wanted to really mostly wanted to hear how the uh, how the downstream uh, distributions are doing. But uh, as for a lot of my work in desktop and GNOME, it's mainly just about uh, making sure all the libraries actually work as intended. Uh, make sure that the user experience of uh, of all the all the various uh, desktop environments and window uh, window managers and whatnot are like I said working as intended. And um, it really um, probably probably best known for uh, maintaining uh, cinnamon and parts of uh, parts of the GNOME stack. So, um, so yeah, just happy to be here and uh, happy to answer any questions and uh, any other uh, any other uh, inquiries that uh, we may have. Okay, great. And uh, I see Simon is back now. So uh, why don't you uh, introduce us to Hello System and uh, um, what your sort of goals and, and target uh, market is? Hello, sure. So I didn't dial in using Hello System today. I had to use, unfortunately, <clears throat> a different operating system and promptly it crashed on me. I'm very sorry for that. <laughs> so yeah, um, please forgive me. I'm still very new with all of this. Uh, as a matter of fact, I ran FreeBSD on the desktop for the first time not even a year ago. And what started out as this test SSD just to play around with just morphed into my daily work system and I've never switched since and it slowly morphed into what is now Hello System. So all is very new. So if you're asking me who is Hello System for today, well, it's not even in 1.0 yet. But if things go well, and if we bring it to where I would like to bring it, then basically it's for everyone who, well, let me say it this way. I watched very closely people's desktops uh, of the presenters in this, in this um, conference. And I noticed that not everyone is using FreeBSD yet on the desktop, and not everyone is even using open source software yet on the desktop. And there are a few people out there who like to have a global menu bar at the top on the, of the screen and the icons on the right hand side in familiar places. And if you are one of those people, then Hello System maybe one day is for you. So okay, the idea is to make it really friendly, especially to switchers coming from other well-known platforms. Okay, excellent. Um, so um, uh, both, um, uh, Eric and Simon, what um, 
my, one of my questions is sort of what aspects of the FreeBSD um, uh, release and build and distribution process work well for you? For example, um, you know, the, the ports collection, are you able to use um, uh, packages? Uh, do you use upstream uh, packages verbatim? Do you have to build your own? Um, how, how well are uh, you able to integrate with um, uh, FreeBSD? How do you consume FreeBSD? Um, that sort of, sort of thing. Eric, you want to start? Yeah, I can go. Uh, yeah, for us, uh, we use basically the port tree and the um, uh, and the source code. Uh, we kind we kind of differ a little bit because we use uh, OpenRC for the init system. Other than that, the rest is basically the same. So. I, uh, we we build the ISO from packages, but all our packages are built from uh, the fork uh, we have, and we also build DOS with ports. Uh, that was from TrueOS. Uh, basically, everything that goes busy use right now is forks from TrueOS, and we are maintaining it. So when we build an ISO. It's all built from port, uh, from packages, including DOS is a packages. Um, so, okay, um, yeah. Um, and basically, we're we're building everything ourselves. We're not uh, using anything pre-build from um, FreeBSD, but everything under the hood is basically the same as FreeBSD other than OpenRC. Um, I don't know if I answer everything, but I think yeah. it is, yeah. Oh, and we use the latest table, which right now is uh, 13.0. Okay, um, and uh, same question for you, Simon. Um, I mean, that, that's one thing I didn't mention specifically, but is a, is a really good point is uh, is tracking FreeBSD stable branches versus current versus releases that uh, what, what model you use for um, moving forward to, to newer versions from FreeBSD. Yeah, so actually we're doing this uh, quite differently um, from GhostBSD. In Hello System, we are using all the binaries as they're coming from FreeBSD for the base system and also for the packages. We are currently on 12.2 in the upcoming Hello System 0.5 release. We are also building test builds uh, on 13, but we have found some smaller topics that are not optimized yet that still need to be worked out. And this is why we are currently on 12.2. And um, as a matter of fact, um, we would like to take as much as possible in terms of binaries unchanged from FreeBSD. So we don't want to have a different kernel or different packages, or um, basically we would like to stay as close to the original as possible. Okay. Um... And I guess this is probably the um, the part that's uh, uh, much more kind of open and um, ripe for discussion um, is uh, where do we need to go in, in FreeBSD um, with respect to uh, graphics and uh, desktop focused um, uh, needs and how, how can the project uh, basically have infrastructure and components in place that um, uh, that you can make use of. Um, I'll, I'll maybe start off with um, either Manu or Charlie if there's any kind of feedback we want to um, start with to seed the discussion. I guess I can. I guess I can. You know. You know. Contribute something here. Um, lately in, um, in places like Discord and IRC and, and a few other spots, but, but also just, I, just even my own, uh, my own experience is just maintaining the desktop ports, 
um, especially with uh, with cinnamon and and, uh, and even helping out with some of the gnome stuff. And actually, forgot probably uh, pro probably should also mention that uh, Eric uh, did a lot of the uh, mate porting uh, for the ports trade. Um, you know, quite a bit of it. I actually used mate for quite a bit until I finally got cinnamon to work. Uh, just kind of as a side note. Also, um, but uh, but he also ported something else, which I will actually uh, get to in this discussion here, which is uh, actually the subject of it. Um, a lot of folks have been, uh, you know, especially especially those who might not be as comfortable on the on the command line or you know manual configuration. Uh, network configuration uh, on the desktop has is has always kind of been an issue, especially with wireless configuration, with wireless uh, Wi-Fi and all that stuff. And uh, so, I mean, like traditionally in FreeBSD, you got to go in and, uh, you know, mess around with WPA supplicant.conf and if config and all that stuff, you know, on, under the command line. But, you know, especially, especially if someone's just, uh, you know, just, you know, opening up their laptop for the first time and putting FreeBSD on it, putting some desktop on it, and then all of a sudden none of their network works, especially the Wi-Fi, it's like they use it for two seconds and it's like, nope, not, never again. So one of the one of the big asks from the community that I've seen from Discord and IRC and possibly the mailing list as well is some sort of a, some sort of a network manager graphical user interface sort of a deal. So this goes back to what another thing that Eric has ported over, which is or has created that is also in the ports tree called Network MGR. It's actually just a little Python uh, tray program. Uh, that uh, that does a little bit of that WPA supplicant.com for you uh, is able to you know like you can see which uh, which networks are available that are broadcasting all that stuff and there's also another program called Wi-Fi Manager which is kind of the same deal a little bit more advanced but both of those are I would say kind of clutches for the fact that we don't actually have something more integrated so something like the actual network manager from the free desktop project. And that one has interfaces for the, for like a, they have like an NCurses interface, and then they have the various uh, GTK and Qt interfaces for it. Unfortunately for that, uh, there are major architectural issues that prevent it from actually being ported in whole here. Uh, particularly, a lot of Linuxisms, uh, actually maybe even too many Linuxisms, but also it's kind of a monolithic architecture. You can't really separate the library part versus the individual implementations. So that's one of the that's one of the big uh, stumbling blocks, I would say. Um, so I could continue on, but I think some other folks might have some stuff too. Yeah, I, think I agree with a lot of what you have said, but I would even start one step um, earlier on because I'm new to all of this. And this was for me actually a big stumbling point. I mean, um, when you start the FreeBSD installer, it's all text-based. And people tell you uh, you have to add yourself to some groups for graphics and whatnot. So I think the very first step to get people into seeing FreeBSD as a system that's really suitable for the desktop is to treat graphics really as a first class citizen of an operating system. And I know that BSD and Unix is coming from this background of Storage and networking, these are the big two points right from the start. But along the way, the rest of the world also moved on to include graphics. And this is what I think still not happening yet on FreeBSD to have it as a integral part, meaning that XORG, the graphics drivers, including the proprietary ones are all tested together and released together and are very easy from the installer to just set, I want graphics, and then at least go to a, um, um, a terminal that runs on XORG or something. Manu, your, uh, your comments? Uh, yeah, I, I hear all the, uh, all the complain, et cetera, but uh, the, the issue is deeper. Uh, we, First of all, we are not, uh, and we should not be uh, a generic uh, graphical uh, operating system. Uh, when you create an operating system that uh, that install uh, XORG or WLAN and 
and, or anything, they usually choose uh, either GNOME, KDE, uh, etc. for you. Or you have some, for example, in the Linux world, uh, some distros that let you choose in the installer what you're going to um, I don't think that it's free job to this problem. It's the job of, uh, All right, we seem to be having some audio technical difficulties uh, with uh, uh, Menu, so I have uh, muted him for just a second here. Um, hopefully, uh, this will clear up in, in just a moment. Um, I think uh, there is an interesting... Um, uh, um, an interesting point here, um, and I think, you know, the FreeBSD as an upstream certainly um, our historical practice is that, you know, we're not going to try and make that um, opinionated, opinionated decision that this is the desktop environment that you shall use on, on FreeBSD. Um, but I think that it's a very good point um, that's been raised multiple times during this, uh, this discussion, the, this, this overall summit, um, that friction is a, is a big issue, that if there's uh, something that um, is easily avoided, uh, you know, if there's a, a minor issue, but it's easily avoided, we really ought to avoid it. Um, it's, it's for someone new to the community, uh, it is very unfortunate if there's all kinds of extra steps that are either poorly documented or perhaps unnecessary um, that uh, we, um, we put in the way of, of um, uh, of having a good experience. Uh, let's see, uh, Manu, is your uh, audio working uh, again? I don't know. We can yeah. test. You're good now. Okay. Well, I've yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's Wi-Fi or anything. I've just reduced uh, the window size of Firefox. I don't have any video glitches right now. So yeah, maybe that was related. And I've stopped the webcam uh, from streaming too. So. Maybe it would help with the audio, I don't know. Uh, and yeah, I don't know what I was, uh, where, where I left, uh, so yeah. Let, just, just continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, <clears throat> concerning like uh, everything about uh, FreeBSD, for me, I think FreeBSD provide a, a good base for a desktop. Uh, usage um i've been using for busy on the on the desktop for oh wow i think like 14 years and it's it is currently like like basically right now i'm using ghost bsd but uh it's for me it's the same thing uh i don't think for busy should focus on making it more easier for the user to install everything that because it's gonna get too much complicated for FreeBSD. The thing I think FreeBSD has to focus is just having the tool, uh, dunk, the, the packages working really well, the graphics stack working really well, having everything that's graphical uh network uh working really well and i think for me i've been using for busy for many years i the only part i've been having problem with is um wi-fi that's it for me it's it's always been wi-fi uh it's i would like to see wi-fi get uh ec support and ax support 
that's the, basically the, the only problem we mostly have with users is Wi-Fi support. Yeah, certainly uh, uh, at the, the sort of driver lower um, uh, lower layers of the whole system, um, uh, Wi-Fi support is is very much an important thing that that's, that needs some um, some significant uh, effort still. Um, I, I want to bring it back to one topic that's come up here a little bit, um, and that's there was you know the the point raised about uh, Linuxisms um, in the past, um, and I think we we can't deny that in the kind of open source desktop environment world, um, Linux is a um, uh, a key um, a key player, and uh, there is um, you know. We, we sort of, by necessity, there are going to be things that um, we need to adapt and accommodate um, with, with Linux as sort of the, the primary motivator of various things. Um, so I'd like to get your take on um, how we interact in a, uh, in a world where, where Linux is, um, uh, is sort of making decisions. And uh, we have, you know, we have, we have ways of using Linux applications and Linux kernel code, um, the DRM uh, graphics stack is uh, dual licensed code that is shared with Linux, for example. Um, we have the Linux emulator for running um, uh, running Linux binaries natively on FreeBSD. Um, what's, what's your take on how best to interact with that world? Well, I see this uh, from two perspectives. One perspective is running existing Linux applications. So that would be, of course, fantastic if I can just go download something that's available for Linux, but not yet for FreeBSD and just can expect it to run. And uh, the situation as of today is almost there, but I think it could be made a little bit better by not just providing CentOS 7, but also um, a user uh, environment based on Ubuntu or Debian, because that is what most desktop applications are developed for and tested with. So uh, that would make the, the actual running of Linux applications a bit easier. And one technology that I have been working on actually for a long time, app image packages a whole Linux application into just one single file. And there is work underway to get that run on FreeBSD. And having a Ubuntu-based runtime environment would ensure that um, binary compatibility, library compatibility would be much better than what we have right now with uh, CentOS 7. So that's the part of running existing Linux applications. But at least for me, I didn't come to FreeBSD to have a nicer Linux. I actually came to FreeBSD because I expect from FreeBSD things that work like Unix and not like, well, it's not really Linux, but the stack that has been built up on top of Linux and on top of the kernel with things like Dbus, the various XDG specs. Nowadays, there is talk about Wayland and Pipewire and whatnot. And many of those things seem to get started very focused on Linux and more specifically on Fedora and then go from there into the world and sometimes work, sometimes are half broken. That was a reason for me. I wanted to leave all that behind and go to a, to a different Unix. And that's why I came to FreeBSD. All right. And uh, Eric, your thoughts on that? Uh, me? I, I would surely like to see um, desktop fully... Um, integrated with BSC uh, because uh, it's like I, I'm there's new stuff in Mate uh, that is it's uh, it's um, I tried to find my word um, it's embedded in, in system D and that part like uh, I probably when I have time I'm probably going to remove that part from uh, one of the package because um, there's a lot of things like that. And, but the thing is other than that software wise, like uh, I, I ported yesterday uh, sublime text for, because I wanted it. It, it is using Linux uh, on 
on FreeBSD to um, have it working, I don't have a problem with that because if I want a software, if Linux Linuxator is there, I'm going to use it to make my stuff work. But me, it's more on the desktop side. I would like to see some things pop up, but it's the only thing I can see happening on my side is probably that I can do it one day, but it's it's a lot of work. Other than that, me, if I have a piece of software that won't, and I need the Linux Linuxator to run it, I'm going to use it. I don't have a problem with that. The it's I don't have much problem uh, with uh, software when it comes to software. My my issue is mostly like desktop side. All right, uh, thank you. So we are um, approaching the end of our uh, time slot here. I'd like to give everyone uh, a final opportunity to um, weigh in, and if you have any um, final thoughts or or specific things that um, you would like to pass on. Uh, to the broader FreeBSD community. Um, now is your, your opportunity uh, and I'll start um, with it. I'll go in the, uh, uh, in the order on my screen here. So we'll start with uh, Charlie. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so I, I actually fully agree with uh, both of you as uh, downstream folks, uh, you know, like especially with uh, in, in really in all aspects. And, uh, and, and then like just over here at the, with the uh, desktop team and the GNOME team and KDE team and all that stuff, you know, it, yeah, it, it's a really delicate, it's going to be a really delicate balance and try to, and try to, you know, balance both, you know, what, you know, what you, Simon, what Simon wants, you know, like with, you know, kind of not doing it the Linux way per se, you know, kind of doing it the classical Unix way, but also be able to support you know, like those who want to, who are probably coming over from Linux, who probably want to keep their old uh, desktop, their old familiar desktop or running and uh, running, you know, somewhat the same way. So it, it's uh, it's going to be a very delicate balance, but I think we can do it. Uh, and it's just, uh, we just have to put put some effort into it, perhaps put some, uh, put some even, uh, put some even funding into it because even historically, uh, a lot of folks who are, who don't do uh, desktop development, uh, kind of see desktop as someone else's problem, uh, kind of an afterthought. So maybe something to consider maybe with the foundation or whoever else wants to, wants to fund a desktop project so that uh, whoever doesn't want to use the mainstream ones can have a choice of doing so. Um, as, as for the network stuff, uh, you know, like the, it, it's like, especially with network manager, you know, like it's, and, and actually even the Linux systems, uh, just how network manager actually calls does a lot of Linux syscalls to actually activate or deactivate network interfaces. And it reminds me of like, well, it, it's really a matter of like, wh where do we ship all this stuff? Cause we probably have a lot of, uh, we probably already have a lot of interfaces kind of analogous to what the Linux world has. I mean, we, we've done the shim with dev D and UDev dev pretty well. It works, it works well. And, uh, you know, especially for X and, uh, and a few other things. Now it's just a matter of like, okay, let's connect the other dots. Let's connect the other dots that the Linux world uh, uses, or, or you know, or we have alternatives like Console Kit too. And then, and we'll just uh, go from there and see, uh, you know, see what else we can do. So, yeah, that's really that's really it. All right, thank you. Uh, and uh, Manu. Yeah. So uh, I hear all the complaints with uh, with quotes around uh, and I understand them but uh, uh, I think that's well there's two problems uh, the problem the first problem is a chicken and egg problem is that people develop uh, apps and frameworks like uh, Gbus and and everything audio like uh, what, whatever the, 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 the name uh, Alza and whatever in Linux world is. Uh, they develop it on Linux because uh, their customer is using Linux. And of course, it will be causing problems for us. Uh, the thing is that for years, we tried to uh, adapt this for BSD. Uh, and things that if you take Dbus or uh, Polkit or whatever, uh, everything desktop related, that have Along the year, a lot of problems and a lot of security issues. Just see the the, the recent Polkit uh, CVE that was released uh, a few days ago or, or today or yesterday. Uh, the thing is that 
those frameworks uh, answer a problem. I think they answer it badly, but this is not the the talk uh, about that. I think that we don't have any alternative for that. Uh, for graphics driver themselves, it's just, uh, I would say, a, a funding issue, but it's not really the case because I've been working for the FreeBSD Foundation to do some of the graphic stuff recently. Uh, the problem is that if nobody wants to use FreeBSD to do desktop stuff, nobody will uh, fund any developer to do uh, graphic stuff on FreeBSD. And I'm glad that the FreeBSD Foundation did that uh, with me last year. I hope that we can continue soon to do that again. But I will understand if one day FreeBSD Foundation tells me, well, sorry, but uh, we cannot, uh, uh, how do you say that in English? Uh, we cannot understand the need for funding you to do graphic stuff if no one is using our graphic stuff. So that's a big chicken and egg problem. Um, I don't know how to solve this. Uh, this is not a, a monologue about how to solve this issue. But uh, yeah, I, I will, honestly, I, I hope that a lot of people will join to help me and everyone to work more on graphic stuff, uh, mostly kernel wise, because if you solve problem kernel wise, a lot of the username problem goes away, usually. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that will be my final word. And if people want to talk to uh, me more about that, feel free to uh, join the hardware track or whatever, or send me mail or IRC or whatever. Okay, thank you. And uh, Eric, your your final thoughts? Um, for me, um Something I, I would like to see it's maybe uh, people more engaging uh, uh, with uh, tools like uh, Network MGR because um, Charlie was saying like uh, like um, like Network Manager from the Linux world is there's Qt interface, GTK interface, there's a Qt interface, uh, Curse interface, and the the thing is. Network MGR is open to um, having all those things. Uh, we, we, I welcome everyone to, even if it's in the Ghost Busy repo. It's more, it's more like my my thing that I made for FreeBSD and Ghost Busy. Um, uh, if, if anyone that's interested to help with that, it's Python, simple Python. Uh, with Python, you can use Qt, Curse. Uh, so for that, I can welcome everyone from the FreeBSD site to help me make it better because I don't understand everything about FreeBSD and there's probably better way to do it than I'm doing. But the way I'm, I know to use FreeBSD, that's the way that it works. Other than that, um, on the graphics side, I hear a lot of good things. I really like it. Um, I think um, I I would like to see a lot more emphasis in um, the Wi-Fi side. I know it's uh, it's it cannot be done tomorrow, but for me, it's a big thing that we see and goes busy. We miss a lot of opportunity, and we there's a lot of users that come from us. And my card is not supported. Oh, my card has only only download at twenty one megabits, and it's not fast enough. So, it's uh, other than that, for everyone that's involved in free busy, good job. Uh, I'll. I'll I'm probably going to still use that for years, so I have not, nothing much complain other than network. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll have some uh, good news on the Wi-Fi front from some foundation-funded projects in the, the near future. Um, and uh, that's definitely a very, um, very important uh, aspect that uh, that we really need to 
to make some progress on. Um, all right, uh, Simon, I'll leave uh, uh, the final word to you. Yeah, I just want to say a very big thank you. And really two things stand out in the FreeBSD world compared to other communities. And that is community and documentation. I mean, this community is so welcoming and helpful, even for a newcomer like myself, who hasn't done this for even a year. There are lots of helpful people. There are There is help in the kernel ongoing for the app images stuff that I was describing. This is really fantastic. Keep it up. Also the documentation, you can really find documentation and that is really great. Okay, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Eric, uh, Simon, uh, Charlie and Manu for, uh, for taking the time to uh, discuss graphics and downstream distros. Uh, and uh, John, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. So we're going to take another five minute break. And when we come back, we'll have a session on Beehive um, shared by Peter Grahan and myself. Oh, and yes, if you want, uh, go run over to the hallway track during our break. Uh, we can check more there, uh, especially if we can follow up on some of the discussions we just had over in the hallway track.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is our last technical session of our summit uh, for the summer. So for our last session, we're going to have a kind of working group discussion uh, with Peter Grayhan and myself and a few others about Beehive. So let me see. If I, Peter gave me some slides. I'm going to go grab those and share them. And actually, we also need to find Peter. He was on Zoom, but I don't see him now. Well, <clears throat> amusingly enough, I've managed to not find the slides I'm supposed to present. Uh, da, 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 da. There isn't. One can have too many open windows, it turns out, to try to find the right one in Zoom. Oh, there's Peter. Uh, can I just test um, my screen share? Yeah, since mine is not cooperating, why don't you go for it? How's that? Yes, excellent. Thank you for rescuing my inability to get preview to work. <laughs> oh, did... Um... You need a, you have a PDF that you wanted to um, display? No, I, I thought you were going to have me display them. So I was trying to get them. Oh, to okay. Them. But that's all right. We're all good. Charge ahead. Um, oh, are we on now? Yes. All right. Um, so uh, I guess we don't have a whole lot of time. So um, that's okay. We, the schedule is kind of shot, but it's all right. This is the last yeah. thing of the day, so we, we, we'll be fine. We don't have a special thing afterwards today, so it's okay. Yeah, so John and I were just going to um, have a bit of a talk about Beehive. I've got a small um, presentation just about some upcoming work. I mean, there's a lot more that uh, I'm not covering, um, but I just decided to kind of randomly pick some stuff, probably more the things that I guess um, I've been looking at. Um, I'm not sure if Andy is around. I guess we're hoping for an ARM update. Yeah, I'll go see. And the other thing is, um, if anybody has questions, we can just answer them on the fly. Okay. And Andy is here. I've, I've, he should be able to join us. All right. So let me just... Uh, run through these. All right, so I've got just a small set of projects here. They're listed in increasing order of complexity and um, decreasing probability that they're going to get done anytime soon. So first up is Vert.io. Um, 
Beehive's initial device models were only Vert.io. There's been a whole lot added since then, but it's still kind of the workhorse, uh, certainly for Linux VMs and um, FreeBSD, maybe not so much Windows. Um, but uh, the implementation in Beehive is kind of from, you know, the 2013 timeframe. The first spec uh, was fairly simplistic. Um, it's the version number is actually called 0.9.5. I don't know why. Um, but in the, it's almost seven, eight years since that was done, there's been a number of spec updates and probably the most important one was Vert.io version one. And um, they kind of rationalized uh, some of the data structures that are, are shared between a host and a guest. It's not, not really that different. Um, but what's happened is that uh, some guests only support version one, they don't support the older version. And some of the device types are only described in version one, there's no 0.9.5. So the longer Beehive supports that, um, the more problems we're going to have with um, guests not supporting it. Probably the most recent one that came up was Vert.io input that went in. Uh, it's actually not supported on Linux in anything other than version one, so we can't use it there. Um, however, uh, there is um, some work uh, that has been done for this, which upgrades, or at least provides all of the infrastructure to upgrade to version uh, 1.0, 1.1. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to put that in soon. Um, one of the problems that we have with Vodo or having to support multiple versions of Vert.io is that um, at a minimum, you want a way to specify which version you want, but you also kind of want the default version to be the latest possible version. But then you have the other problem that, you know, when somebody creates VM, you really want that version to be frozen in time. So we kind of have this problem where, um, you don't really want to uh, be locked into the oldest possible version forever and never be able to move forward. Um, but it's not quite clear how to really represent that. I mean, having to put in a version every single time is kind of a bit of a headache for users. They really shouldn't really, they shouldn't need to know these low level details. Um, so that's kind of an open question with this work is, uh, you know, how do we um, try to move forward, but at the same time, um, not break when we update what the default version is. And the other problem we have is that because there's, you know, older OSs that only support 0.9.5, like if you want to run a FreeBSD 10 VM, um, you know, there's, there's really kind of a compatibility jump between 0.95 and one that if we only support one, we can't work on 0.9. 0.9.5. So one proposal I have right at the end there is just, if we actually just change the name from vertio dash device to just VIO, and then we leave vertio dash is just a way of specifying kind of the, the existing format. So anybody that has an existing config will stay locked into 0.9.5 forever, but that should be okay because that's what they're working with now. But then if we have a new name, then we can, kind of move forward and say that that tracks version updates and then that could also have a version specified with it. So um, I'm very interested to know what people uh, think about that. Hmm. My initial thought might be, I wonder if we can just have a Vertio version that defaults to the right thing, but I guess you want it to track in the future and not be fixed at 0.95 as a default forever. So I have to think more about if that would work. Yeah, we definitely don't want to be stuck at 0.9.5. I mean, this, you know, say for example, for Vodai input, it's it's not really very useful at 0.9.5. It only supports Windows, and yeah, you know, we already have X working XHCI for Windows to get uh, input, so it's not it's not so. It, I mean, we could actually just cut 0.9.5 support for that because it hasn't shipped yet. 
and and that will be the same for any additional new device that we supported, like if we ever do Verio um, GPU or something like that. Um, but it's more a case for, you know, Verio and then a Verio block, which are the kind of two most commonly used devices. Right, yeah. It probably only really matters for them because like even random, I don't think it would break anybody one way or the other. All right, the next one on my list is um, what I call external USB. So uh, Beehive has a um, XHCI USB controller emulation. Uh, there's currently only one device model which um, is behind that and that's the USB tablet. But uh, in theory, we could put anything we want there. The controller emulation is quite complete. Um, however, it's there's kind of limitations with that. When you connect a device, it's stuck there for the lifetime of the VM and it can't be changed. Where for USB, what you really want is something, which is how it's used in real life, where you have a physical cable and a plug and you can just walk up to a machine and plug it in. So uh, that's kind of useful for a, a lot of different reasons. Um, so my proposal for this is to have a model which is just called remote and it's basically just a proxy where uh, because USB is already a message based protocol and it already handles attach and detach, um, we can just have, for example, a Unix domain socket, which uh, just has a um, message based version of USB that goes across it. And then we could have the USB device model be external to the Beehive process. Um, and you just implement the device model there. Uh, so this this would be one way that you could emulate plugging a USB stick into a Beehive VM, uh, or if you have a um, a USB device that you wanted to pass through into Beehive into a VM that was already started, you could just detach it and then you know run some kind of daemon that just uses libusb to talk to that device and then uses the remote protocol to um, talk to, to to the hypervisor. Um, and also uh, you could write device models in whatever way or language you wanted to. So for example, you could write a Python script that could emulate a, a USB device. Uh, and this allows functionality to be added to Beehive, um, you know, outside of a release schedule um, because you could just write a port that emulated a particular USB device uh, because Beehive doesn't really have to look at any of the semantics of these messages. Uh, you could write, as long as a guest understands that device, you can add that functionality um, to the hypervisor without having to modify the hypervisor itself. Um, it turns out there's a whole lot of different ways of uh, running USB over the wire. Linux has USB IP, which is sort of abandoned. Um, RDP has a remote USB protocol. Uh, the SPICE protocol, I guess it's kind of the QMU specific version of VNC. It also has a remote USB protocol. Uh, they all seem to have advantages and disadvantages. Um, it's not clear that, that even implementing any of those um, would be better or worse than just doing a custom version. So I'm still not really sure what path to go down with that. Um, I haven't really done too much on this yet. One thing I've done is um, Linux has a bunch of test function uh, devices that are very simple, like just echo data from one USB pipe to another. So I have a software implementation of that, and also have a hardware implementation of that on a Raspberry, Raspberry Pi Pico, um, which can be used to kind of test proxying against real hardware just for a very simple device. But um, there's still a long way to go with this. All right, the next one on the list is GPU pass-through. So this has kind of been kicking around for a long time. I think it's um, been resurrected with a whole bunch of patches that we received from Corbin Cohn, who's from Beckhoff. And he's given us um, a pretty large patch set for Intel GVTD, which is pass-through for an integrated uh, GPU. Uh, he's also given us one for a, um, AMD APU, uh, but they're quite large and there's sort of a lot of dependencies on other parts of Beehive changing. So 
in particular, the 64-bit PCI support for pass-through in Beehive is, um, it was a little too specific. The initial version required a Xeon that had um, a large um, number of physical address lines that didn't really work on desktop machines that have in Intel integrated GPUs. So we've had to fix that, but then that there's a cascading required change that's needed in EFI because EFI advertises where the 64-bit hole is uh, to the guest that's running. And then we have to dynamically modify what are currently static tables. Um, so there's more work there. Um, we also seem to need PCI ROM support to initialize uh, GPUs after they've been reset. Um, there's sort of a change of that that came in with some VGA work. Um, so it's, it, on the surface, it sounds like it's not that big a job, but there's just a whole lot of cascading changes um, that have to be done to support it. Um, the other issue too with uh, just entire controller pass-through is you either need a dedicated graphics card and a separate monitor, um, or it takes over the, you know, your existing monitor. And that's probably not too friendly if you have a, a graphic system and you just want to run like a VM in a window. So the solution, at least from Intel for that is called GVTG, uh, which enables you to carve up an Intel integrated GPU into a number of kind of smaller sections. And then you have a slightly modified way of pass through where a guest can access just a portion of the GPU hardware. But to do that, we actually have to modify the Linux DRM code because there's a whole lot of hooks in that to handle this. Um, so that actually seems a fairly complicated piece of work because we have an in-tree portion and then we have an out-of-tree portion and we have to somehow glue those together. Um, NVIDIA's uh, high-end solution is just standard SRIOV. Um, so I think that actually might have the most chance of success without changing anything, but it's also the most expensive. Um, so I don't know, I had plans to do work on GBTG, but um, I've just never really been able to carve out enough time to get to it. And last on my list is uh, moving Beehive to a uh, single process model. So currently there's kind of these separate admin actions of creating a virtual machine running a virtual machine and then destroying a virtual machine. Uh, and there's multiple processes involved there. Uh, and the problem is that there's a resource that's created that lives sort of on its own. It's not really tied to any process. So um, this is one of the reasons why Beehive still runs as root because you don't want to give people the ability to create um, you know, these objects that use a lot of system resources um, and can, you know, severely impact the operation of the system when these people uh, aren't privileged users. Um, however, if it's tied to a process, kind of like anything in Unix, the resources that are used by a process are accounted for and uh, there's a whole lot of um, limits that you can apply to a process. And then also, uh, you know, you can re reclaim those resources just by killing that process. So this is how QMU works, or KVM works on Linux. Um, it's definitely kind of fits more into the Unix model. Um, however, the problem that we have with Beehive is that we have to be able to migrate from this kind of separate model that we have into this single process model. <laughs> And the most obvious places where that shows up is where we have an external loader like Beehive Load or Grub Beehive, which kind of run as a separate process and create this VM object. Um, so for Grub Beehive, there's kind of less and less people using that. Um, EFI works pretty good with almost all Linux distributions and has for quite a few years now. So I think, and also Grub Beehive is, um, it's not really being maintained, doesn't support XFS properly. I know Chuck, Tuff, Chuck Tuffley has done a sort of an updated version of that, but it might be simpler just to uh, retire Grub Beehive. 
Um, beehive load for running FreeBSD is still quite useful. And I think we can kind of mimic um, the way it works with a single process just by starting a process in beehive load and then backgrounding it. And then when you run beehive, it actually just picks up the existing process that was created. Um, so we're not actually, we, we still have a, an object that's tied to a process. It's just hidden from the user, but it will at least allow them to carry forward scripts that they have and beehive load itself is still kind of a useful tool. Um, so the other um, reason for doing this, as I mentioned, it, it kind of provides a way to not have to be root to run a virtual machine. Um, because now we have all the resources tied to an actual process. Um, you know, we can use existing um, limiting um, whatever mechanism you want just to restrict what an actual uh, non-root user can do. And, you know, the ultimate way of controlling this is you just kill the process that's associated with the VM. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm sure there's probably a lot of things that I haven't thought of here, but at least that's that's the path that I want to move to, to be able to allow non-root users to uh, run VMs. Um, yep, that's all I had. I mean, there's probably 20 more of these, but uh, we've only got 30 minutes and we probably want yep. to talk about other things. And well, then there's lots of other stuff in progress by lots of different folks. I know for myself, um, Mostly I've just tried, I've been spending a, what time I have for Beehive kind of trying to see if I can shepherd in some other things. I have a long backlog of things to help with. Um, probably next to my plate are some of the suspend and resume fixes uh, that other people have contributed as well as some other follow-up patches from UPB on suspend and resume. Um, but I know one chunk of exciting work is uh, work on ARM64, which the folks at UPB have worked on, but also Andy Turner has worked on. And so Andy's here. I don't know if Andy, you might be able to do a demo of ARM64 booting in a VM under uh, Beehive. I have one. I can work out just your screen. My screen. Sure. Um, hopefully, you can see a um, my screen now. Yeah. At least one window. Yeah. And I, so I'm, I, this is a, uh, I have a free, this is a FreeBSD machine in the room next to me running a fairly recent or a current version of uh, FreeBSD 14 on an ARM64 machine, on ARM64. So it's a, it's a, one of the, um, it's an in, in the Neo Vision one development platform that um, has, has loaned us. Um, so I've got been testing and updating the Beehive code from UPB to um, fix a few issues we found and get it into a state that we I think we are happy with. So uh, you can see the script at the top I've been running. I'm running, it just runs. I've more, I'm already running the single, or almost a single process model um, because I only support run it booting from EFI on ARM64. So if we if we were to have a single process model, it would be a lot, we, we wouldn't have a problem with ARM64 at all with this. Um, so unfortunately, I'm okay, so I can boot into U boot. I'm not sure why I get a random piece of garbage on the UART. Um, I've, I've traced, traced it and I've sort of got no idea. Um, but you can see it booting the FreeBSD loader um, and standard FreeBSD. So performance-wise, is it kind of comparable to bare metal and kind of the um, same way as it is on x86? I'm not really sure. This is, this is also a neat boot machine. So some of the, I may, we like this issue, we may be seeing some, like it's hanging here, may just be because it's trying to load 
the disk off the network, uh, which might, seems to sometimes be a little unstable. Uh, but for development, it's fine. Development of Beehive is fine. I, I would like to you know, actually run a performance, see what the performance is like. I have got a disk in this, in this, um, the, the, this, this server it's running in, but I haven't tried um, right, booting off, be, booting from Beehive off that. And this is another place where I need to look into why it's suddenly slow. May I try a um, MD5-T or OpenSSL speed? Uh, yeah, I did, well, I haven't looked at any of this. I can, so, so, so what command was it? Open your cell. Oh, MD5-T is a simple one. Yeah, it looks pretty good. This is speed. Oh, open open SSL open. speed and then say SHA two five six, for example. Uh, no, I I think no no dashes in front of speed. It's just speed okay. as a command to open SSL. Yeah, so I think uh, you might have a problem with the clock because yeah, the time. Yeah, uh... it's in my. Um, I haven't looked at that. Was my next to look at is the the clock. Uh, I've been focusing recently on um, getting the interrupt controller right. And there's a few, still a few issues um, around. Still need to look into level versus edge interrupts and. Um, Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. I should look at the clock once I've got I finished off this interrupt control issue, and it's possibly also related to that. that oh yeah, I, I think I'm um, the clock while I've updated the interrupts. Yeah, the speed the speed test runs for three seconds. It just sets a like a SIG alarm. So if times aren't working, yeah, it probably won't come back. Okay, I can look into that later then. Um, and I haven't, I haven't tried to do builds or anything inside of this yet. Most of my testing has just been, does it boot? Well, that tends to test a lot of things as it is. Hmm. Um, cool. And I have, I'm also tried to boot Linux and NetBSD, but Linux will start to boot. Um, NetBSD, I get. I don't even get any kernel output yet, so I have, those are more a couple more things to look into, and I haven't I haven't tried any other operating systems yet. Okay, well, I think we're actually probably close to the end of the time that we have uh, for our slot today, but that was very cool. Thank you for sharing, Andy. And thank you for your updates, Peter. Um, it is interesting to see how Beehive continues to evolve and grow um, and become a bigger and bigger thing within FreeBSD itself. It's always more stuff for it to do. Um, but thank you, guys. So let's do another five-minute break uh, real quick. This will be our last break. For oh, we actually have some questions. Let me see. Ah, so. Um, uh, we'll take a stab at these two questions before I run into our break. Um, Jason Tubner has asked, the status of live storage resize in Beehive guests? That's an interesting question. So um, I actually have a, a patch series. It's mostly been reviewed, and I have some feedback from Peter I need to address that adds the ability for Beehive to notice, uh, at least for Vertio block, if uh, underlying block, the underlying storage changes size, it propagates and tells the underlying guests and the guest kind of notices and resizes automatically. Um, so that's kind of in progress and I should finish addressing the feedback I got from Peter so I can push it upstream. It doesn't 
support uh, Zvols currently because Zvols will need they need to support the KVent to raise a KVent when their file size changes. But I've from what I've looked at, it shouldn't be hard to add that to Zvols. Um, and then Jason has a follow up question: Will that be easy to port to NVMe? Um, probably as long as NVMe has some kind of way to notify the host, like normally in NVMe, that it, it, that storage is resized. As long as we have an interrupt, we can post. Um, it should just be a matter of wiring up the right bits in the NVMe model to do that. So assuming NVMe, the protocol is a way to do that, it shouldn't be hard to add it. And then Alan Jude oh, and Chuck already said, yes, I have patches for that. Outstanding. Um, Alan Jude had asked a question, I think, of Andy, which was, was Andy's demo running on an M1 Mac Mini? Uh, the, no, it's the answer. I have, oh. a, I have a Mac Mini, M1 Mac Mini, but the, uh, the commands you are running under a FreeBSD on a VMware on a, an older Mac Mini, an Intel-based one, and Beehive was, it was SSH'd into a Beehive. Um, and, uh, well, so the, the NFS server's on the Mac Mini, actually, but, and it's SSH'd into, into a Beehive, into a FreeBSD booting on an N1 STP. Just the um, ne um, nearest in one reference platform. Okay. And then one more question uh, we have, which is Are there any plans to support QXL for Windows guests? I'm going to punt to Peter because I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so that's a. Uh, um, uh, a third IO. Um, um, kind of GPU power virtualization. Um, so um, I think Kei Hing actually had a working, he might, he might have, so this, I think there's a couple of different variants of this as well. It's the terminology gets a little confusing. I'm probably confused myself now, but basically it's, it's just a way to sort of do, you know, like open, open GL like um, API pass through so that you can get 3D in a guest without having to implement, you know, a full GPU device model. Um, so the problem, the main problem with that is just the fact that we don't have any 3D graphics in the FreeBSD base system, but Beehive ships in the base system. So for something, for something like this to work, we would need the ability to, um, you know, be able to have, uh, like a dynamically loadable vertio device model that could then link against um, some 3D libraries that came from ports, and then at runtime, you know, Beehive could incorporate that. Um, that's probably useful uh, in general, and not just for something like QXL. But that's why it can't happen um, right now. Okay, and then we had one other question here, which is someone has a couple of NVIDIA A100s and is asking if there's anything they can do for help. I guess this is maybe in regards to testing SROV. Um, but I mean, yeah, aside just... from testing it and letting us know if it's broken, perhaps, I'm not sure. Absolutely, yep. And if they, you know, we could always supply updated patches for them to try out to see uh, how things go. Yes. Okay. We have another minute or two to see if any other questions pop up. Okay. Well, thank you again, Peter and Andy. Um, and we'll take about a five minute break. As a reminder, after our break, we're going to do our closing session. And one of the things we're going to do in our closing session is we're going to do a FreeBSD trivia game, as it were, uh, using the app Kahoot. Uh, you can use a web browser client to do it, or you can use an app on your phone or a tablet. So we'll post some links to, to remind us to Kahoot in the chat. So you can use this time during the break to download Kahoot on your phone if you don't have it, get it set up. And we'll see you all in about five minutes.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back for our last session of our uh, Summer Developer Summit, this edition of our FreeBSD Developer Summit. We hope you've enjoyed all the time you've spent with us over the past three days. We've certainly had fun over here as an organizing committee. A couple of reminders as we get started with our last session. Uh, we are going to have a quiz on Kahoot, as we've mentioned a few times, and we'll be posting the pen to that in a little bit when we get when we're ready to start the, the quiz. Um, so go ahead and pull up a web browser or install the app on a device if you want to participate. Uh, as we teased before at the beginning of today, there will be a, a medal for the winner, as, along with bragging rights. So you definitely want to compete. Um, we do have a survey with that we'd like your feedback on how this event worked for you. Like what was it was like to participate in the, the summit, which things worked, which things didn't work. Uh, we'll be dropping that. The link is already on the wiki. We'll be sending it into the various chats. So please take a few minutes and just fill out a survey, share with us your thoughts so that we can do a better job in the future uh, with other summits. Um, as far as YouTube and the videos, we will be posting some post-edited individual videos of each session in the future uh, in, at some point. So you'll be able to share those and not have to share the whole stream with all the commentary, um, but can share individual talks. And the last thing uh, I wanted to talk about is we do anticipate doing some sort of Fender Summit again in the fall. Um, whether it's in person or whether it's virtual, we'll still have to wait to see how the world exists uh, by the time fall rolls around, as well as exactly what time it is. Will it be perhaps sometime in the October, November timeframe? Uh, but we'll be announcing that well in advance once we have more details. So just be watching your mailing list or Twitter or however you get your FreeBSD news uh, for when we announce our next summit. So with that, uh, the next thing I'm going to hand it over to is actually Deb from the FreeBSD Foundation. She has uh, some thoughts she wants to share and things she wants to talk about for a bit. Thank you, John. Uh, you finally get a break. <laughs> so I probably have the worst situation here where I'm having uh, housework, um, some repair work done right underneath my office. And of course, they just started drilling. And so I have two dogs locked in my office. And one is, seems to be a guard dog or acting like a guard dog right now. So I still be barking every so often. Um, but uh, I want to thank everyone um, for attending this event. I, um, I mean, first, I'd like to say I, I hope everyone enjoyed this. I was amazed at the diversity um, of the talks. And it really ended up being more like a FreeBSC conference, which we haven't run before. And so I, I'm so pleased with uh, the talks and, um, and the fact that we had over 260 people who registered, watched, and participated in this event. So um, that is awesome. Um, I'd also like to thank the organizing committee, and that includes Ann Dickison, Ed Mast, Mark Johnston, Lauren Gurkowski, John Baldwin, and myself. So now, on behalf of the foundation, um, I'd like to recognize someone from the FreeBSD community who has made significant contributions to the project. And so I'd like to share my screen here. And like John said earlier, it's always finding that right window. And making sure it doesn't take over your whole screen. So I know this is a surprise, um, but John Baldwin, we would like to recognize you for all the work you've done. <laughs> Oh, there go the dogs. Planning, budgeting, dealing with catering, inviting individuals and organizations, and overall running FreeBSD Developer Summit for so many years now. I'd also like to give a big shout out for the work you did on these last two virtual summits, which provided new and different challenges from anything we've done in the history of FreeBSD. And along with the organizing committee, you oversaw planning the days, picking the talks and sessions, and most importantly, I'm seeing every session for the past three days. FreeBSC summits continue to be successful, and that's due in large part to you. So thank you, John. I'd also like to ask Ed to step in and 
Um, mention some of your technical contributions. Yeah, so I don't think I can um, uh, do the uh, the work that John has has done any justice. Really, um, I did look at some uh, some stats, um, and uh, the first uh, commit I find um, uh, looking at Git, maybe uh, there's um, some history I've missed somewhere or something. But um, is uh, Saturday, September twenty fifth, nineteen ninety nine. Um, and uh, I, I see 6,888 commits in the source tree, 200 in doc, and, and 162 in ports. Um, and so certainly John's most well known for um, lots of very um, uh, deeply technical kernel work, um, but John has done uh, work on all areas of, of FreeBSD over a um, over more than two decades. Uh, so it's it's an incredible amount of uh, technical contributions over time. So I think we're good. John, do you want to say anything? <laughs> Oh, um, by the way, oh, actually, before you say anything, you don't have to. Um, we are, besides this uh, beautiful certificate, um, you will also be receiving a cool personalized coffee mug. Ah. Okay. So I'm good. Do you, should we move on to the games? John, you want to say anything? No. Yeah. Last for word. Um, well, that, yeah, y'all are funny. Um, <laughs> thank you guys. Uh, thank you all. Um, but yeah, let's let the game begin. Um, Michael is going to host our quiz and trivia. So that this should be quite enjoyable. Um, it is true, several of us work together to collaborate on these questions. So. As, as the organizers, we're not going to participate. We're going to watch and enjoy um, as all you attendees get to do the quiz. So this should be a lot of fun. This should be relaxing. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael if you want to take it from here. And we need to share the pin. So let me go po post that everywhere while we Michael did. gets set up. I have posted the pin in the chat. Can okay. you hear all me? Three chats? All there's three chats. You? There's Discord, there's, there's Slack and IRC, and there's Oh, YouTube. dear God. Um, I think I John, the uh, the pin will be listed on the um, the screen that we share as well. Oh, okay, that's excellent. I'm still going to splat it in some more places. Yeah, please do. I'm going to share my screen now. Or share a. Okay, right. did that oh, share? Up. Yes, it worked. Okay, because it won't show me what you are seeing now. Okay. Well, we give some folks some time to sign up. We're up to 24. Absolutely. I know there's a lot more than 24 folks watching. If folks are listening, it's 563-2581. And, and I have to say that um, one, I'm delighted that people feel that a June Dev Summit is incomplete if I'm not wandering around asking impertinent questions. So thank you for this invitation. And two, I was impressed at just how evil some of these trivia questions were. So I, I'd like to commend the committee You're on digging deep. Glenn says he's disappointed you're not on uh, IRC. Ah. <laughs> I'm afraid if I had IRC handy, I would spend my days blithering on IRC and not actually making books. Indeed.
before I forget, uh, whoever wins the trivia contest, please uh, let me know. So make sure we have your contact info <laughs> so we can send you your fabulous medal. So that's just a reminder, whoever wins. <laughs> do we want to show? Oh, I don't know if we could do that now with Michael sharing the screen. Do you want to show the fabulous medal so people, more people will join and it'll be pretty competitive because everyone's going to want it? Oh, it's a medal of beauty. <laughs> Anne, Anne sent me the picture and I, I mm. would be proud to display this on my office wall and show it to all my coworkers if I had any. Well, I think uh, the next time we get to be in person, whoever wins, you, sh you really should bring this so you can wear it proudly during the next summit that we have in person. Like it's a badge of something. <laughs> Absolutely. This, I guess this is like microwave and popcorn. We kind of wait till the rate of people adding slows down. <laughs> and we decide we're good. I would say give it another 60 seconds or so. Yeah, I'm not good good. That. So last call. Yep. The conductor on the train. Time to get on board or, or just watch. few more seconds here and I will give up. If someone keeps like, it keeps bouncing now between 40 and 41. Someone's undecided. Oh, here we go. 42. That's, that's a pretty good number. That's a very good number. <laughs> oh, <sighs> come on. Well, oh. wow, gosh, I was just to about to, me. yeah, I was just about to call it, but a few more seconds here. And this is a, uh, this is an important contest for bragging rights, clearly, so. Oh, certainly, most definitely. Oh, yes. Okay, I think we're probably ready. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I'm I'm calling it. Three, three, two, one, start. Welcome to the trivia contest. When is free BSD day? Choose the color and shape on your screen that matches the answer. It's only a few seconds. You don't have time to Google. There we go. June 19th. And Renee is in the lead. Come on, you folks can knock him out. What type of animal is Groff? If you've been to a Dev Summit, you should know this one. He is a goat and... 
Someone thought he, he was a dog. Okay, let's see here. Rene is still in the lead. Lightning fast gamer reflexes, I suppose. What is my favorite flavor of gelato? I did not propose this question. Okay, here's the thing. There are no wrong answers to this question. So total gimmick, wow. Come on, someone knock Renee off the top. Here we go. Which FreeBSD release switched from A out to ELF? This is real trivia. That was version three. Wow. Oh, Ellen is creeping up there. Who wrote the first book on FreeBSD? I'm standing in front of you. You should all know this one. Greg Leahy, complete free BSD. Those of you who thought it was me, thank you, but no. And and Kirk's books on 4.4 and 4.3 didn't count because those weren't on free BSD. Correct. Those were BSD books. And Alan has the lead now. Oh, here we go. We all miss Ottawa. What is the room number of the first floor hacker lounge? at the University of Ottawa Residence Hall. Here's a hint, the MPT is a disk controller. Oh. Alan is still in the lead. Here we go. How many 1.44 megabyte floppies were required to hold the binary distribution of FreeBSD 2.0? Everyone should know this. I don't know how you could not. I believe I looked at the release notes, or, or maybe I actually looked at on the FTP site to see how many files were in bin that whatever. You're the best kind of bastard, John. It's no <laughs> wonder they honored you. Which act of God occurred during a prior BSD can? Oh, I, I, I don't know if COVID counts as an act of God during the conference. Yes, all of the above. BSD can is always exciting. Oh, come on, someone take Alan out. How many of Warner Losh's laptops have caught fire at a previous developer summit. The answer is zero. He had one catch on fire at home and he brought the carcass to a dev summit. There we go, Brooks creeping up. 
What unusual object did the Peter Wem Murphy field conjure up in the middle of a freeway at 3 a.m.? Yep, a Christmas tree. Mind you, I would put none of those past Peter. Oh, Brooks, go, put him down. You can take him. In what year was the FreeBSD Foundation created? I remember when this was just a pipe dream and they, they fought to make it happen. And I'm delighted that it's still around and still supporting. And yep, year 2000. Yes, Brooks. Go on, Alan. You can take him. How many files were removed from the 4.4 BSD network release 2 as a result of the USL lawsuit? Here we go, the answer is three. But those three files were a heap of work. Ooh, Mar Peak creeping up. How many architectures have been removed from the FreeBSD source tree? Again, I'm, I'm seriously impressed by the committee's bastardry and coming up with some of these questions. Uh, well done. The answer is four. John, do you happen to know which ones they are? That would be Alpha, which I got to do, PC98, A64, and Spark64. There you go. Mark Peak in the lead. What type of food can you not order at Cora's in Ottawa? I miss Ottawa. Here is hoping for 2022. Remember, it's what you cannot order. And Brooks just called me out. I forgot about Sun 4V. Ooh. <laughs> and the answer is beaver tail. I myself have gone to Chorus and ordered a great big mug of heavy cream. It's delicious. Oh, Alan is back. Oh, come on. Oh, and Damon has three correct answers in a row. You know who to gang up on. On what hardware did the first Unix kernel run? Unix. Hint, it was not a Sinclair ZX80. PDP-7, there you go. Alan's still in the lead. On what hardware did the first BSD kernel run? BSD kernel, and yep, the VAX, which FreeBSD never ran on. Oh, Mark Peak creeping up. Um, HRS and Mark Peak, come on, you can take Alan down. What is the longest running BSD conference? Asia BSD Con, Meet BSD, BSD Con, or Euro BSD Con? I believe this means years, not days. We have not had a three week BSD Con. Yep, the Europeans. And this one was a bit, the trivia was a bit fun on this one. Um, 
because I initially didn't have this one right, but it turns out there was a, I remember it, there was a conference in Brighton in 2001 in the UK, and that's kind of, it's counts that's, as the first Euro BSD conference. Okay. HRS in the lead. Ooh, and Tufik Takaya is climbing fast. We may have a surprise winner. What's the origin of Mount Zenu's name? There you go, Unix spelled backwards. HRS still in the lead. Oh, and M. Horn is climbing fast. Number 19, which file do you edit to require a password in single user mode? This one was mine because I hate all that is good and wholesome in systems administration. Etsy TTYs, flip it to secure. Oh, Alan is back. Okay, one last chance to knock him off the top. I'm counting on all of you. Question 20. How many in-person FreeBSD developer summits have been held at BSD CAN? Fourteen. So our number three winner, Damon, congratulations. Number two, oh, Alan is number two. Yes. I don't care who wins, just that Alan loses. HRS, hurrah, good for you. With Brooks and Keltia in number four and five. And I think that is when I stop sharing my screen. Well, we can see which questions either I had the wrong answer to or were hard for other people to see. Ah, well, let's see. 6% correct on Warner Lash's laptop. Um, and in everyone's defense, Warner has lost a lot of laptops, just none by fire at the conference. <laughs> and hard drives. Hard drives. Oh, hard drives. Oh. Uh, yep, that was a, uh, the, the floppies question was lovely. It's been years since the Hacker Lounge has been. And, open and to us. What, what were the wrong questions? U90 was is the building that the, the round lounge is in. Yes. DMS 1160 is where is the building where the conference is. Yeah. And MPT is a storage controller. But it's also Mont Pettit. It's another, that's also a room oh. on conference. We've had a couple of BSC cans in Mont Pettit, I think, or Mont Pettit. I'm sure I'm pronouncing it okay. wrong. When is free BSC day? Come on that the foundation sponsored this conference. You should at least know when it happens. Come on, people. Which act of God occurred? Well, people remember the sinkhole, but we've had people trapped in Canada by volcanoes erupting in Iceland. Yes, and the earthquake. I distinctly remember the earthquake. Oh, the earthquake was, was very memorable. On so which are yeah, so there's some debate about this one because Warner asserts that two BSD ran on the PDP eleven. So all I can say is blame Kirk, because Kirk <laughs> was the source of truth for this one. I'm all right with that plan. How many architectures have been removed? Most people did not answer. I gather there was some I, I see some discussion. In so there's, some, there's some debate about the way in which this was counted. I certainly missed Sun4V, and I was counting directories and sys that got removed. So, for example, 
MIPS in the future would not count as removing seven architectures, just one. So partial removal of all the ARM bits, I didn't count as an architecture. Well, when someone is the greatest committer, they, they're going to make some mistakes. Peter Wem. Oh, I miss Peter. And yes, <laughs> he, he had Christmas trees. And when was the foundation created? And in all fairness, that was over 20 years ago. Those days are hazy. On the other hand, I have strong memories of getting Build World past the A out to ELF transition. Uh, yes. I had to. It was, it was definitely a uh, trial by fire. L at least at that point, we had added Build World and Install World as separate steps. I remember doing a 2-2 upgrade, which you still had make world as one step, and Lord help you if it broke in the middle somewhere. Oh, oh those were the days. Who wrote the first book on FreeBSD? This was a tricky one. I'm proud to say I came up with it in the hope of confusing absolutely everyone. Well done. What is the longest running conference? Euro. Yep. Just before BSD can. And how many developer summits? How, how, am I, how are we supposed to remember this? No, that's, that's very good. Y'all did very well guessing that one. Um, yes. I had to go back and look at my own notes and count up. So. Yes. What file do you edit to require a password? I think this may be the answer that had the most. Correct. It's one yeah. of the two answers that had the most correct. So a bunch of competent sysadmins here. Congratulations. Well, and thank you very much for hosting, Michael. That was my pleasure. I enjoyed it. And thank you, everyone, for playing along, even with questions that perhaps had slightly dubious answers <laughs> in a few cases. <laughs> um, and thank you everyone for coming to the Developer Summit this year. I know it's different not being able to be in person. Um, we don't all get to go out and go to dinner somewhere and have candied bacon at the, whatever the place was in Ottawa we've been through the last few years. Um, but thank you for coming. Uh, Thank you for spending your last few days with the rest of us. Um, as I said before, we will have some kind of vendor summit in the fall um, and we'll have more details about that when that happens. The hallway track is gonna be open for quite a while. So while it doesn't have candied bacon, if you wanna wander over there to hang out, uh, please come over and hang out with us. Uh, enjoy just hanging, you know, maybe we won't do a tour of Warner's basement this time, but we'll do something else. Um, but we'd love to see you over in the hallway track just to talk, catch up on things. It doesn't have to be technical. It can just be hanging out. So until next time, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, and we'll see you the next time we have a conference.